Good afternoon all. We are here for a hearing in the matter CA 010-2019 before Chief Justice Zaki Azmi, who is appearing by way of video conference, His Excellency Justice Omar al-Mahiri, and His Excellency Justice Ali al-Mathani. The appellant is represented by Timothy and Co. Lead counsel is Rupert Reed QC. The respondent is represented by Clyde and Co. Lead counsel is Michael Black QC. Uh, okay, I'm here from London. Um, okay, can, can I get your names again, please? I don't have the privilege of having the list before me. Can I get the name Lord, of the yes. councils again, please? My Lord, yes, I'm Rupert Reed. Reed, R E E D. R E E D. And my learned friend, Mr. Michael Black. Michael Black. Uh, I think. Uh, you have to look to that side. <laughs> <laughs> uh, appears for the uh, respondent. My Lord. My Lord. Yes. My Lord, I, I appear yeah. for the yeah. appellant. I'm going to refer to the appellant as FAB generically, but your Lordships will be aware that there is a first uh, and second appellant. First, Abu Dhabi Bank, BGCSE, the first appellant, and FAB Securities, LLC, the second. Both of those entities uh, share the fact that they are Abu Dhabi registered, licensed and headquarters and have no presence uh, whatsoever, as far as I'm aware, in the DRC, not even an ATM. Uh, uh, as for Lama... Just hang a minute. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to get the volume increase. The volume is not so clear. Can you hang on? Mm. Give me one minute. I'll get somebody to help me. Of course. You can sit while Chief Justice uh, looking for someone. Uh, yes, please continue. They are, they are coming to increase the volume. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. What uh, you're saying? Yes, please. I, I will try and be especially clear, the Lord. Um, Good. Thank you very much. Mag. Larmag, the respondent, uh, is a Netherlands uh, property investment business. Now, the judgment and the order under appeal are the jurisdictional ruling of uh, the 4th of August 2019. There are essentially, uh, and, and the reference is bundle A, tab 4, and it's towards the back of that tab. I think it has page 37A. And the reasoning uh, uh, appears, uh, I should say, first of all, the ruling was made only three weeks after the interim proprietary injunction of the 18th July 2019. The reasoning is contained in the, essentially the final three pages of the judgment, starting at paragraph 30. And it may be helpful. Would you mind just raise your voice because you cannot hear, I believe. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, go ahead. Uh, did you say so page just, 13? Uh, did you I'm say page 13? Say yeah. Page 11, internal numbering of the judgment, uh, paragraph okay. 30. Yeah, okay. Got it. I got uh, it. And in this, good, in this paragraph, uh, the court... Uh, Sir Richard Field sets out the test. He refers to the two cases of Adil uh, and Elsico. They are, we yes. accept, they, they set the standard in terms of the importance of the legislative purpose. Uh, then at paragraph 31, he refers to the, the, the comments by Sir Anthony Coleman uh, in uh, the Al Farafi case. Yes. Uh, and and I, I'll read through that if I may. It's necessary to keep very clearly in mind that the ultimate and dominant text 
is in Arabic, and this court is using a translation to arrive at the true meaning and intent of that Arabic text. In this correction, it is to be remembered that Arabic may not lend itself to as precise a facility of expression as legal phraseology as English. Thus, uh, translation may re result in what appears to be a very precise expression in English, but which too narrowly defines the meaning of the original Arabic text. That is why it's important when construing DIFC legislation, such as Law 16, which I should say is the amending statute to the JAL, not by a literalist construction of the English to lose sight of the legislative purpose underlying the text. Now, yes. we, do, do, we do question, uh, if I can put it that way, the assertion that, that Arabic isn't a precise language. We, in, in our submission, there isn't a license to this court simply to read the JL very broadly on the basis that uh, Arabic is somehow uh, imprecise uh, and, and by implication has less words. Uh, th that, in our view, is a, a suggestion or, or a, a, a comment or a view that should be uh, subject to scrutiny and, and can be subject to scrutiny because this court is clearly the Court of Appeal and is entitled to review that sort of comment by uh, an earlier Court of Appeal. And moving on to paragraph 33, in the present case, is the, case the parties have advanced rival meanings of the Arabic word that is translated in the English version as authorised. However, no expert evidence is proposed to be called on the meaning of the original Arabic text, and without such evidence, I conclude it would be impossible for the court to decide what meaning is to be given to the Arabic word that has been translated as authorised. I shall therefore not attempt to decide which of the rival, meaning, rival meanings of the Arabic word in question is the correct meaning, but shall instead adopt the approach uh, prescribed in Karafi of not allowing a literalist construction of the English translation at the expense of losing sight of the legislative purpose. And we suggest there is an error here. Uh, one, one doesn't simply by reason of finding that there is insufficient uh, evidence as to the meaning of the Arabic, one doesn't therefore uh, assume the widest meaning of the Arabic. Uh, in, our, in our submission, that is a very bad way of reading and construing a statute. Uh, paragraph 34, reference to the, uh, ref to the comments of, of Sir John Chadwick in Corinth uh, and, the, and the explanation of the party jurisdiction. So party jurisdiction exists regardless of any transactional nexus. So even if there is no uh, contract which is to be made or, made or performed in this jurisdiction, even if there is no transaction or incident in the jurisdiction, if a party, uh, if a uh, DFC establishment or licensed DFC establishment is party, there is party jurisdiction regardless of the lack of any connection, other connection to the jurisdiction. Uh, paragraph 35... As the Court of Appeal has observed on more sorry, than one Sorry, sorry, uh, Mr. Reid, uh, I don't yeah. follow, I beg your pardon, I don't follow the argument that you were putting on uh, paragraph 34, that it is, uh, what, what uh, Sir Richard said was just say that it is, uh, uh, once it's shown that a party by or against whom the civil or commercial claim is brought is an entity, enterprise, license, registered, or authorized, the requirement under paragraph A is met. What, what was your comment against, again, against that statement? Well, we, what was that we that you don't accept, agree with? Well, we don't accept that it was authorised. We say authorised has to be construed narrowly in terms of the authorisation by licence by the DFSA. The, you'll, you'll appreciate, uh, having read the judgment, that uh, the approach taken by the judge below is that authorised means generally permitted, and where, therefore, there is an exemption to the prohibition, either under the... Uh, the regulatory statute, the regulatory law, or under the uh, regulatory, the DFSA rule book, uh, that exemption from the prohibition is in effect an implicit permission, and therefore that is in effect an authorization. So it's, it's essentially an issue uh, as to the breadth of, of the construction of authorization. I can make that issue more complicated, but that is, that is the heart, if you like, of the issue. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, paragraph 35, there's, there's reference to the fact that party jurisdiction, if exorbitant, can be mitigated by various doctrines, including foreign non-convenience, and this court will be very familiar with the application of the foreign non-convenience doctrine. Uh, and then there is reference to the step-by-step uh, -step approach that was urged upon the judge uh, by uh, LAMAG. Uh, that approach was rejected, so paragraph 36, I declined to accept this approach. And then he gets to the meat of, of his judgment. In my judgment, yes. when construing the definitions in Article 2 
and Article 5A1A of the JL, the Court should have regard to the background financial services regulatory regime as exists at the time the construction exercise being undertaken, and my Lord pausing there, we, we would agree with that, should not conduct a process of comparison between former and current regulatory backgrounds. Similarly, we would agree with that. That, that said, I reject the response contention that the Article 2 definitions are to be construed strictly in the light of the narrow technical meaning to be given to the wording of the background regulatory regime. And pausing there, that, this obviously is where FAB parts company with the judge, because he's saying when you look at words like authorised, registered uh, and licensed, you mustn't assume they have the technical meanings that permeate all of the, uh, the regulatory regime, that permeate the uh, markets uh, law, the regulatory law, you have to approach them, I think, autonomously. So you just, just look at the word, don't look at the background, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and you, can, you can broadly construe them, and you can broadly construe them because there's no evidence, or there's insufficient evidence as to translation, therefore you're licensed under Harafi because, because Arabic is, a, is an imprecise language to just adopt a, a broad meaning. That is, that is, in essence, the, the nub of, of the heart of this appeal. Mm. I take this view having regard to the legislative intent underlying Article 5A1A of the JAL, which I hold to render those entities which are officially permitted by the DIC regulatory authorities to provide financial services to customers in the DIC or otherwise carry on business or conduct any activity in the DIC. So he says, well, I'm, I'm going to ascertain the intention. The intention was that anyone who does anything uh, or is permitted to do anything uh, in the DIFC should be subject to DIFC party court party jurisdiction. Uh, and then jumping briefly on to 38, adopting this approach, uh, I conclude that by virtue of the DFSA entering the names of the respondents and its list of recognised members, thereby entitling them to trade on NASDAQ Dubai as members of that exchange with DIFC customers free of the limitations contained in, uh, in REC, that's the recognition module, Rule 2.5.1G, each of the respondents is authorised and or registered by the DFSA to provide financial services in accordance with DFS, DIFC laws and is therefore a DIFC licensed establishment. So his yeah. focus is on definition yeah. of licensed DIFC licensed establishment, DIFC licensed establishment yeah. rather than DIFC establishment. Mm -hmm. And then finally picking up the 41, I, I am not to be taken as deciding that all recognised members are licensed DIFC establishments and as such are susceptible to the jurisdiction of a court. My decision relates only to recognised members which are licensed and supervised by a financial services reg a regulator in the UAE. How many such entities there are on the list of recognised members maintained by the DFSA, I know not. So he yes. very curiously restricts his judgment to UAE regulated entities. So any uh, UAE regulated entity that is a recognised member uh, and is uh, for the purpose of trading on NASDAQ Dubai, uh, only the UAE regulated entities will be subject to the party jurisdiction of the DFC court, will be DFC licensed establishments. Mm. Now I'm bound to say we don't entirely understand that restriction because even if the non-UAE uh, recognised members don't uh, have the benefit of escaping the conditions in the rule book, they are still able albeit on an execution basis, albeit pursuant to an unsolicited request, they are still able to trade on NASDAQ. They are still recognised for that purpose. They are still listed for that purpose. And therefore, when we are considering the intentions of the framers, we have to ask whether it, can, whether it was really the intention of the draftsman of the JAL that recognised members in the broader sense should be subject to the party jurisdiction. Well, maybe this Mr. Reid, because something in the background, which you, you might not know about it, when the, DIF, the DFSA start to launch its services, there were a real distinction, maybe, between the local entities that which the DIFC is supposed not to compete with, mm. and there is an international players. Yes, the, you, I think there is sort of distinction in here. You might not refer to it but, but until now, but... Well, it's, it's hard to know what the distinction is. The impression one gets, uh, and it is a matter of impression, reading the consultation paper from 2012 when, it, when, it, when, the, uh, yeah. when, the, when the exemption was moved from the regulatory law into uh, the re recognition module of the DFSA rulebook, is that because it's a, essentially a friendly, friendly regulator, because we know the SCA, for example, in the UAE, because we know the uh, Abu Dhabi UAE Central Bank, 
we can have particular confidence in that regulator, and therefore we're willing to extend the exemption so that they can uh, trade on, 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 they can give advice, uh, and they can trade on, a, they can solicit uh, to um, DIFC customers uh, in respect of trading on, on, on NASDAQ Dubai. So that, that's the suggestion. I, I, I don't sense any lurking uh, political issues or, 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 or any, any other, any, anything more complicated or, or more significant than that. But that, that is a matter of impression. It's very hard to know what the DFSA is thinking. Obviously, it produces very helpful consultation paper, which I'll take the court to later. But there aren't, for example, travaux préparatoires, there, there isn't a lot of background documentation in terms of DFSA policy. So well, that, I'm not claiming that I understand mm. exactly the DFSA policy, but if I would like to refer to the law number, the federal law number eight that was establishing the DFC, and I do remember that, then the legislature tried to uh, draw that kind of distinction between uh, launching the DFC services to a local market Yes. and uh, completely into a different forum to the international yes. open market. And I do recall that, and I do invite you to go to the uh, federal law number eight of 2004, the one, uh, the federal law that yes. established and allow for the establishment yes. of the DFC and the providing of its services. Yes. We, I mean, I, sh I should just say, uh, in terms of these, these members, in terms of banks in the UAE that are able to trade on NASDAQ. Uh, it's not envisaged that they are only uh, trading for um, UAE uh, customers. Clearly, they will be market making, uh, will, will involve uh, customers, well, certainly if they're placing trades, that may be for customers outside the UAE. It's, uh, in my submission, it's more likely to relate to the regulation and the confidence that the DFSA can have in the regulation by another UAE regulator. Um, um, you may move on now. Okay. Um, I should, I should just say that uh, the injunction uh, that was made, uh, and indeed the disclosure that was sought but not ordered, are both strongly opposed. But those are not the subject matter of, of today's appeal. Uh, in terms of why they're in, uh, opposed, and just so you, the, courts under, the court understands, they would, the injunction, we say, would expose FAB to uh, allegations that it was not acting in breach of its mandate, which is obviously a very serious matter as a matter of uh, Abu Dhabi and UAE law. And similarly, if disclosure were ordered and had to be given, there would be very significant issues of banking confidentiality, both at the private level and at the public level. The only element for this court uh, today is jurisdiction. And the question is whether the DFC court has party jurisdiction over FAB uh, by reason of its exemption under REC 2.5.3, that's module, the recognition module 2.5.3. Pursuant to that exemption, it can trade on NASDAQ Dubai for customers in the DFC uh, and pursuant to solicitation and after advice. And to that extent, uh, can it be said to be an authorised uh, uh, establishment? The issue of uh, statutory construction uh, arises in respect of Article 5, 1A and Article 2. Uh, in terms of the JAL, uh, it is, unfortunately, uh, we have to look at two bundles. In English, it's in the Learned Friends bundle, the Respondents Authorities bundle, behind tab 4. Your Lordship will be very familiar with this particular translation. The Learning Friends Authorities, Respondents Authorities, uh, Tab Four. We have a uh, This is the uh, this is the version that is published on DFC Court's website. Uh, it's consolidated pursuant to the uh, changes in 20, 2012. Uh, there is an Arabic version of the same bundle, but that is the Arabic version of the old unconsolidated statute. So to get the relevant wording in the Arabic. You have to go to my authorities bundle. Uh, behind tab five. And this is the 2011 uh, amending statute. 
This is the argument that you put before the court of first instance, the distinction between authorized and permitted. Is that it? Is that what you're saying? My Lord, yes. My Lord, yes. Yes. Sorry. Lord, yes. Um, so here at the bottom of the first page, we have Article 2 as to be substituted into the JL. And then the third page, Al-Mada Khamsa al um, which is obviously the new, t the new provisions for Article 5. And obviously for our purposes, at the top of the second page, um, we have DIC establishment, Mwasa al-Merkaz, and then the second, the third defini definition down, um, licensed, Mahasa, the uh, licensed DIC establishment. So those are, those are the original texts uh, in, in, uh, in Arabic. Curiously, uh, we've been unable to find online a consolidated Arabic version of the, of the JL. But, but the wording that your lordships will be required to construe uh, is that in this text, uh, in my authorities bundle behind tab five. In terms of DIFC establishments, and if, one, if we move to the English now, which is in um, Milan and Friends authorities bundle, Now you're referring to the I'm English to version? To, I'm going to refer to the English, just... Yeah. Okay, Mr. Black uh, version, right? Yes, Mr. Black's version, yes. I don't have the privilege of having those copies, but never mind. I, I've read through uh, the uh, Sir Richard's judgment. I think he sort of... His judgment. Never mind, just go ahead. I'll, I'll look at it later. Okay. You, your Lordship's right. He does set out the, the words I'm going to refer to early in the judgment. So I'm referring to the definition of DIFC establishments, uh, and uh, as it says that any entity or enterprise established, licensed, registered, or authorized, and my Lord, you, you will understand, we say those words have technical meanings in the regulatory uh, regime, to carry on business or conduct an activity within the DIFC pursuant to DIFC laws, and we say pursuant to DIFC laws is an important uh, sign in terms of how those words are to be construed. Uh, and the judge below said it wasn't clear what, what was supposed to be pursuant to DRC laws, but quite clearly in our submission, if, if it's an enterprise uh, established pursuant to DRC laws, i.e. it's trying to the IFC company, then pursuant to DRC laws is clearly, spoke, it's clearly intended to qualify established because a DFC company, as a DFC, as a, an enterprise or an entity, established pursuant to DFC law. And we say, by the same token, pursuant to DFC laws, um, it also uh, qualifies licensed, registered, and authorized. So those words fall to be construed by reference to DFC laws. And we'll look at the regulatory law, we'll look at the markets law, and we'll look at the DFSA handbook. Am so I might to understand? Yeah. Go on, Chief Justice. Uh, am I to understand that what you mean is the body must be registered under the IFC's laws? That's what you actually want to say. When you say pursuant to the IFC laws... Yes, well, I, well I, I'm, I'm making it more, more complicated. I'm saying, first of all, the word, if you look at entity established pursuant to DIFC laws, that is yes. generally understood to mean a DIFC company, so a company that's incorporated in the DIFC under DIFC law. And okay. I infer from that that pursuant to DFC laws, with Khan Le Tawanin al Malkaz, uh, is qualifying not only established, but also licensed, registered, or authorized. So for our purposes, we are asking whether uh, FAB is registered or authorized pursuant to DFC laws. Okay. I don't know if that also answers uh, His Excellency's. And yeah. You saying Isn't there's no, no, no way to accommodate the meaning that the business itself can be carried out or conducted in accordance with the DIFC laws. Well, you, that, you just want to refer there that pursuant to the DIFC law is the licensing itself. That's what you would try to say, sorry. Well, it, it, if that's right, then what you'd have is any entity established. Uh, to carry on business within the DFC according to DFC laws, 
So if I have a business, if I set up a business in England with the intention of carrying out business in the DIFC, that business being carried out in accordance with DIFC laws, that, uh, that would throw the net very broad. That English company would then become a DIFC establishment. So if I've got an English company that uh, is established to set up a restaurant in the DIFC, Mm -hmm. uh, but you go very secular now because you <laughs> want to do that. Even the English business you just tried to mention would be completely in separation from being given a certain license to be conducted. No, well, the well, I'm, 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 I'm not. No, I'm not talking about licensing here, my lord. I'm not saying about licensing. I'm even saying I'm. I'm. I'm, I'm mentioning the conduct of business itself. Mm. You, you try to be very secular and says if, well, some, if someone set up business somewhere else with the intention well, to do it in the DFC, of course. The English company setting up a restaurant in yeah. the GFC will want the restaurant to be conducted in accordance with GFC laws. Yeah, but they cannot but that, conduct but it without certain licensing according to the law again. Yes, so the, yes, both the, things have to be read together, Mr. Of Reed. course, of course. But to the extent that they are licensed or authorised, for example, by a relevant regulator, or registered, then they come within those definitions. I'm, I'm asking whether they are DIFC establishments by reason of their having been established um, to conduct business in accordance with in the GFC, in accordance with GFC laws. We, if, I'm, I'm perhaps overcomplicating it, and perhaps uh, it is, this is really aimed at showing that pursuant to GFC laws, in our submission, qualifies established, licensed, licensed uh, uh, registered... Oh, so the licensing laws. should be according to the GFC yes. laws? Yes, yes. The conduct of business? My Lord, yes. Yeah. I see your argument. I'm great. Yeah, but Mr. Reed, I, I don't want to jump over what you are trying to submit, but uh, you cannot read the word pursuant to just in that article 2, because as the judge rightly went through, I think, depending on what you have to say, he went on to explain how it became pursuant to the, the IFC laws subsequently in his judgment. I'm, I'm not sure that's, uh, with greatest respect, I'm not sure that's right. I, I think he, what he in fact said was it, he, he wasn't sure which it qualified, and he wasn't sure that it mattered. Where, where did he say that? Because he went to discuss, in, in short, what he's trying to say, or what I understand is, he said is that um, uh, uh, your, your clients are operating in the IFC to carry on business in the IFC because it is authorized by the FC laws to do so. And that is the pursuant to. Well, he clearly, he clearly, and, said, that they're, they're and, he clearly said that they're authorized to, and he clearly said they're registered. That's, that's in, 30, in paragraph 38. Anyway, Mr. Black, can, can you reply to this later when your turn comes? Mr. Black, uh, take note uh, of this. Yes. Uh, yes, yes, of course. Uh, I, I fact, uh, while my little friend's on it, um, uh, yeah, he, he, he was trying to find the paragraph w where the, the, the learned judge referred to uh, pursuant for. It's paragraph 39, um, uh, my lord, where I think Mr. Uh, I'm, I'm extremely grateful, Mr. Black. So he says it's unclear whether to satisfy the definition of DIC license establishment, the authorization and registration of the entity must be in accordance with DIC law, or the entity's conduct of financial services or business and any activity must be in accordance with GFC law. Whichever of these scenarios is correct, the requirement of accordance with GFC laws is satisfied in this case. Mm. So okay. in construing uh, authorised uh, and licensed and registered, it doesn't really matter from, for his purposes whether in accordance with GFC law qualifies the authorisation or qualifies the activities. <laughs> Uh, my learned friend wants me to read the rest of the paragraph. I'll do that. The DFSA's power to grant the status of recognised members authorised on the respondents or enter the response names of the list of registered members maintained in the GFC register is conferred by Article 37 of the Markets Act. The GFC law in accordance with which the respondents permitted financial service must be conducted is the regulatory law under which the requirements of REC are issued in force. Well, that's simply expanding on the point that he's already made in paragraph 38. I, each of the is authorised and registered by the DFSA to provide financial services in accordance with the DFC laws and is therefore a licensed DFC establishment. 
For now, what is going on in my mind is that uh, your clients won't be able to do business unless they have been authorized by the IFC laws. That is the simplest way of looking at the problem. You must get my permission to come into my area. Well, yes. my lord, there is, a there is a process called authorization. I will explain how the process of authorization is different from the process of recognition. And, and oh, how in, okay. in our submission, there is a very clear distinction between musara lapu in the sense of authorized and recognized, which is not uh, included in the definition of uh, DRC establishments and licensed DRC establishments. Uh, Okay, I, 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 I'm afraid I'm not aware of that. Okay, just go on. Authorization and recognition. Yeah, go on. Um, this is an exercise of statute construction. As the judge rightly says, you need to go back to 2004. In our submission, you need to look at the suite of legislation passed in 2004. So the JL was not the only statute. You also had DIFC law number one. That's the regulatory law. We say that's the cornerstone of the regulatory OG. Unsurprising, perhaps, when what was being set up was a global uh, financial centre. And uh, within the regulatory law, you have the prohibition and you have an exemption uh, from uh, an exemption from the prohibition where uh, tr a trading is authorised by licence in a technical sense of requiring a licence, where it is registered uh, uh, and where it is recognised. But in terms of regulation, it's only authorised entities and registered entities that are regulated because the recognised entities, the DIFS, DFSA, the DRC regulator, relies on the regulation of the home state regulator. Well, my question to Mr. Reed, can you be recognized without being first a registered and then authorized to we, carry out the business? We say yes, because recognition is a separate category from authorization and registration. And insofar as your name is entered on a list of recognized members, we say that's not registration. Uh, the term has been changed. The term is list rather than register. We say there is a distinction to be made. We say these are all technical terms. They are repeated and used consistently throughout DIFC legislation such as the regulatory law and throughout the DFSA regulation that appears in the DFSA handbook. So we say where the English language legislation and regulation refers to licensed entities, machas in the uh, JL, when the English regulation and legislation refers to registered entities, musajal, in Article 2 of the JL, and when it refers to authorized entities, Mosala uh, in the Arabic. And we say that the Arabic in the JL is tracking precisely those technical terms as are used in the DRFC legislation and in the regulation. And the terms that you do not see in Article 2, the definition of DFC establishment, license DFC establishment, what? And you're saying your, your client, the firm, is only recognized and he. Only exactly. recognized to do business, it's not authorized, it's not, not authorized. registered, it's not licensed, it's not registered. nothing of it's that not, kind of definition. Exactly. And the word that isn't in Article 2, in, the defini in those definitions, is mortalif, I recognized. And the draftsman, the Arabic draftsman, excluding that, is sought to make clear that the party jurisdiction extends only to those entities that are licensed, registered, and authorized, and not those that are recognized and therefore hardly regulated because the DFSA essentially defers to the regulation of the home state regulator. And, and so that is essentially our case. These but I are, think maybe next you can tell us how you became recognized, I mean, in accordance with How? I think what, what's your duty next is to tell us how, you, how your firm became of course, uh, well, rec recognized without of being authorized, being fees and registered, and even supervised by the DFSA? Yes, I'll explain, I'll explain that. We will look through the legislation, it's important. So I, I'm if that will come in order of your, of yes. your submission, then I, I would stick to your order, unless you want to answer it. Uh, FAB, as I've explained, is incorporated, it's licensed, and it's headquartered in Abu Dhabi. It was historically the national bank 
of Abu Dhabi. It's licensed by the UAE Central Bank and it's registered with the Securities and Commodities Authority uh, in the UAE. Those documents, the auditor's records, are in bundle E behind tab 2. I think, I think we can accept that as a... Uh, I think we accept that. Huh? Mr. Black, we can accept what uh, without having to refer to the authorities. Uh, for your logic's notes, page 248 to 251, uh, FAB has no branch in the DFC and it has no DFSA licence and it is not a DFSA uh, registered. It is, as explained, a market maker on NASDAQ Dubai for just one share, that's a DP uh, World PLC. A market maker, as you will appreciate, uh, is an entity that undertakes to buy or sell shares at specified prices in order to make sure that there is a liquid market in the relevant share. A market maker is uh, almost invariably trading for their own account. They're not buying and selling as market maker uh, for someone else. Um, FABS, uh, similarly, in terms of its incorporation, licensing, regulation, and headquartering in uh, Abu Dhabi. Uh, it's essentially a brokerage, and it makes no use of uh, the Rule 2.5.3 REC recognition uh, exemption. Uh, your Lordships will have seen attached to my uh, skeleton a list of the, both the recognised members and the recognised bodies. Recognised members are overseas banks, essentially, that want to trade on NASDAQ Dubai or the Dubai Mercantile Exchange, but essentially NASDAQ Dubai. Uh, and similarly, there are recognised bodies. There are exchanges, overseas exchanges, that want to be able to take trades from uh, DIFC um, uh, businesses. Uh, the bond transaction is uh, briefly explained uh, in the judgment. Essentially, LARMAG was uh, expecting a payment of 20 million euros to be made before it, uh, pay, before it transferred various bonds. Uh, it was misled, or it alleges it was misled into believing that the monies have been transferred by um, uh, Elite Holding uh, and a Mr. Al Jabri, and it transferred the bonds on the basis of those assurances, which are said to have been uh, fraudulent. It, it uh, did that pursuant to contracts which it had itself drafted without legal assistance, uh, without any signature being provided uh, by Mr. Al Jabri or on behalf of Elite Holding. Uh, the matter was reported first to the UAE Central Bank on the 14th of November 2018. So initially they went to the UAE Central Bank back in 2018. For your Lordship's notes, E3, E tab 3, page uh, 270. Uh, then by March 2019, they had filed a criminal complaint. So they've gone to the criminal authorities uh, in Abu Dhabi. Uh, and we understand, we've been informed after the uh, injunction was made, that the reason that neither of those bodies investigated was they considered it to be a civil matter. Uh, and what is extraordinary in our submission is that no civil action was then taken in Abu Dhabi. In our submission, the logical consequence of being told, both by the central bank and by the public prosecutor, that they considered it to be a civil matter, would have been to pursue a civil action in Abu Dhabi for a precautionary attachment. And for reasons that aren't entirely clear, that course has not been pursued. What we uh, instead get is a letter, uh, I'll give the reference E, bundle E, tab 3, page 265, which extraordinarily threatens a criminal complaint against FAB, my client, uh, which is an extraordinary allegation and suggestion to make. Uh, so combined with a threat to report my client to the Abu Dhabi criminal uh, authorities, that is combined with a, a, an approach to the DIFC court in seeking uh, an injunction. Uh, as is accepted, the injunction was sought on an urgent basis, and when it was first made, no judicial gateway was specified. And in making the application, it was made very clear that what was... Uh, intended was that the alleged fraudsters, Mr. Al Jabri and Elite Holdings, would ultimately be joined as necessary and proper parties. And your Lordships will be very aware 
of the NPP, the National Property Jurisdiction. Uh, so that uh, seems to us to be an abusive use, an attempt to suggest that um, FAB uh, is authorised and registered and for that purpose to make them anchor defendants with a view of bringing in the real defendants, if the allegations are true, by way of um, or as necessary and proper parties. So that, that is what is going on strategically in terms of why LARMAG uh, is uh, acting in this way and seeking to establish jurisdiction over its intended anchor defendants, the uh, FAB. There's no suggestion of any link other than authorization and registration, well, the alleged authorization and registration with the DIFC. There's no suggestion of any contractual jurisdiction under 5A1B. There's no suggestion of any incident jurisdiction under 5A1C. And indeed, it now emerges that notwithstanding what was said in the March letter, there is no substantive claim against FAB, save insofar as they are said to be a custodian. And what is being suggested is that they ought to have interpleaded uh, as mere nominees or mere custodians. And that suggestion is repeated in the Learned Friends uh, skeleton argument. The uh, DIFC court, uh, the judge, made an injunction in finding there was a serious issue to be tried as to whether Lamag was a victim of fraud. The real issue, is, as we say, was one of uh, jurisdiction. The judge very kindly offered an accelerated ruling. Uh, he was aware of the difficulties potentially faced by FAB in terms of its confidentiality obligations in Abu Dhabi and its obligations in terms of the mandates, contractual mandates. Which is why he gave his jurisdictional ruling quickly on the 4th of August 2019, and he gave it substantially on written submissions pursuant to the initial oral submissions uh, in dealing with the injunction application. Uh, FAB requested uh, permission to appeal, and you'll be aware that the grounds that are set out in that um, uh, application for permission were then uh, said to stand as the uh, appellant's notice. Uh, extraordinarily, uh, a uh, permission to appeal was granted on both grounds. I mean, it's extraordinary enough for it to be granted by reference to public interest or some other compelling reason. But to, to, to grant permission both because uh, the judge believed that the appellant, FAB, had a real prospect of success and because he felt there was a compelling reason in the obvious public importance for UAE licensed and supervised entities uh, that are granted recognised member status. So because it's so important, not just for FAB, but frankly for all of the recognised members, all of the global banks, all of the global exchanges, he felt it was important that permission uh, should be given on that ground as well. So moving to the uh, how, issues how, in the appeal. How, how relevant is that to your, your appeal? what you just said about permission to appeal. How relevant, how relevant is that uh, to your appeal? It, it's, not, it's, not, it's not directly relevant, but it's recognising that the judge who, uh, who had uh, some, some command of the, the papers and had read the documents felt there was a real issue to be tried, and it's a recognition too that he felt it was a matter of real public importance. And there is a suggestion in that that he recognised that the issues may go wider than just UAE uh, recognised members. That it may also, insofar, for example, as he rejected the DFSA view that there is no trading uh, in the DIFC pursuant to the exemption. So the, the DFSA says there's no need for an exemption because there is no relevant trading in the DIFC. He rejected that view and the implications of that rejection alone uh, are very serious for uh, wider, for global banks uh, that are recognised and that trade on NASDAQ Dubai pursuant to the exemptions, the regulatory exemptions. So uh, I'll now look briefly at the principles of statutory construction. I mentioned Adil and El uh, obviously dealing with Article 18 of the employment law uh, and looking to the legislative purpose, which is clearly the, uh, the starting point. We say there is danger in uh, seeking to identify a legislative purpose. And the danger is that you identify the legislative purpose in the very provision that you are seeking to construe. 
and, and clearly there is a danger of circularity in that sort of argument. So, for example, you say that the legislative purpose is that any person permitted to carry on financial services in the GIFC should be subject to GIFC court jurisdiction. And it's on that basis that you construe Article 2 so that authorised is construed broadly to mean permitted or allowed. And, and the legislative effect of that construction is that any party permitted to carry on financial services in the DFC is subject to DFC court jurisdiction. That's why we say if you're going to look at the legislative purpose, you need to look at external uh, reference points. You need to look outside the very provision that you're seeking to construe in order to identify what the legislative purpose is. And we say that external reference point is the regulatory uh, framework. At the heart of the regulatory framework is the regulatory law itself, law number one of 2000 and, uh, 2004. Uh, the uh, financial services geeks will recognise the similarities with the English or the UK Act, FISMA, the Financial Services and Markets Act uh, 2000. So it has a general prohibition on uh, performing financial services in the jurisdiction, subject to various uh, exemptions. Uh, and there are different levels of regulation, as indeed there are under the UK system. And in the lowest case, you have recognition as a form of accreditation, where essentially the DFSA is relying on the home state uh, regulator, which is exactly the same as passporting uh, in the European economic area. So I'm regulated by the UK regulator. I can passport my services into France. I can say, here's my FCA regulation. I'm authorised by the UK regulator. Therefore, I can trade in France without the French regulator feeling that it needs to regulate me afresh. Uh, and this uh, system, this regime, replicates that system of passporting in the European jurisdictions. The text of the regulatory law, which we must look at, is in my authority's bundle behind tab 6. And if I could take the court to that now. Start with page, uh, sorry, Article 23. So we start with the power to make rule. I, I, I wonder if the Chief Justice in London has has that to hand. No, I, I don't have. Is this the latest, the bundle you just served? Uh, well, it's, it's been, always been in the bundle, uh, and indeed it's in both bundles. Um, uh, was this the one handed to us, uh, what, last few days ago? Yes. I got only two bundles received from you on the, whatever date it was, on the thing. Yeah, okay. Uh, where, okay, uh, can, well, can it, you... should be, it should be, the bundle should say Appeal Authorities Bundle on the front. I don't have. I have appeal bundle and appeal exhibit bundle. That's all. Does your Lordship Never mind. Have, yes. have either? You, you can read. Never mind. You just read, read through slowly. Read through slowly. Uh, right. Article 23 deals with the powers of the DFSA Board of Directors. So, sub Article 2, in particular, the DFSA Board of Directors, when exercising the power in Article 23, 1, may make rules in respect of. A, procedures and requirements in relation to licensing, authorization, and registration. So these are the technical terms that are used in all of the uh, regulatory statutes. And obviously, we say licensing is tachis, authorization is tasrih, and uh, registration is tasjih. So we say, the, in terms of the Arabic use of those terms in the JL, here we see the English uh, analogues being used as technical terms. And setting out uh, that it's the DFSA that, pre that, dis that prescribes the procedures for licensing, authorization, and registration. Then if I can move to Article 36. He's saying this is the power of the DFSA. M well, my lord, this is the power of the DFSA board. Yeah. Uh, and then if we, within, obviously within uh, uh, Middle East jurisdictions, questions of authority are very important, so the, the statute is very careful to prescribe very carefully the, the relevant authority. 
Uh, Article 36 deals with the uh, authority of the chief executive of the DFSA. So the powers and functions of the chief executive are, and then picking up at B, uh, to license, authorize, register, recognize, regulate and supervise the conduct of activities and persons required to be regulated by the DFSA by or under D D Dubai or DFS, DIFC law. So again, the statutory draftsman uh, clearly appreciating the technical meanings of licensing, authorizing, registering and recognizing. And indeed, noticeable that the chief executive has a power to recognize or to, to, to uh, deal with the recognition in this in, word, the bill for the first time. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Well, there is a definition section we'll come on to. Uh, and then at part three, starting at article 41, deals with authorised firms, authorised market institutions. So essentially, uh, banks, authorised banks and authorised exchanges. Uh, and picking up at three, we'll get the, we get the primary... Oh, sorry. I should have. I should have. I should go page back to to page four, to paragraph article forty one. So your Just clients your were wish. authorized under this article thirty six, Mr. Reed. Your no, they clients were were they, were they authorized under this article thirty six? No, they were not. They were. They recognized, my lord. There is a. Uh, you see. Recognized. Uh, recognized. Recognized. Okay. Okay. Uh, and the. And the, 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 the articles that you read just now, are they laws of the IFC? Yes, my lord. That is the regulatory law. Yes. It's the cornerstone. If they are laws of, they are laws of the IFC, does that not mean they are authorised pursuant to the laws of the IFC? What? Yeah, my lord, author, authorised is clearly used by reference to DIFC law, yes. And the JL yeah. so statute, the, you know, asking for the, you, the you, DIFC... You accepted that this is these are laws, a eh, the laws of the IFC, and you accept that they were recognized or authorized, or whatever it is, under these laws. And therefore, my conclusion for no, now, no. for now, I'm, I'm, in I'm my sorry, mind, I'm sorry, is they to are pursuant. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt. They are not authorized under the IFC laws. They are recognized under the IFC laws. Okay, recognized, but still they are done what pursuant is, what, to. What, Pursuant to the IFC laws. Yes, please, they are Mr. Not. Well, that, that was my point, that authorised pursuant to DFC laws, recognised pursuant to DFC laws, yes. It's not authorised to, ca to carry out activities in accordance with DFC laws. That's what you're trying, Mr. Reed, you're trying to argue the recognition would never come and fall under the JAL, because JAL did not mention recognition. That's what you want to place yourself. You're not under authorization to do, you're not licensed, you're not anything of, of the any wording that's come up of, in the Precisely. In the Preci job. Precisely. Mother. You are recognized and you are completely different categories to the, to the I, get to categories. I could, not, I could not have put the point more clearly than that, my lord. That there are different categories, classes, if you like, of accreditation. There's licensing and authorized, there's registration, and there's recognition. Those, that distinction between those three categories runs right the way through not only the regulatory law, also the markets law, both DIFC statutes, also the DFSA handbook. And we say to suggest that the draftsman of the JL, albeit that he was using Arabic, wasn't using those terms in, those te in that technical meaning, wasn't referring to those different categories, but was just using the word authorised in permitted, allowed, in some general sense makes no sense as a matter of legislative power. Are you saying recognize as a, a very important technical word that we should be very slow in interpreting? My Lord, and, and yes. Not make it and, uh, and you, even if the recognition allows you to do certain business in the DRC, my Lord, that's what you're to My Lord, yes. And the purpose of recognition is to allow a very light touch regulation for certain uh, members, overseas members, certain overseas exchanges that have very little interaction with the DFC market, that need very light regulation, and that are likely to want to be subject to the party jurisdiction of the DIFC court in respect of all of their global business activity. So we, we say it's a technical 
I, mean, I hope the submission will become clear, and I apologise if I've made it badly, but I hope it will become clear as we look through these uh, statutes, the way in which the DIFC draftsman, the way in which the DFSA is using these words in a technical way, doesn't allow us to, when we get to the Arabic text of the JAL, suddenly start again, autonomously, de novo, and translate Musallah <coughs> Lahul in terms of some broad enabling or Well, quality. I hope this is what you meant by your argument, but it's not completely a new argument, Mr. Reid, as we're going to see, I mean, later. Maybe Mr. Black would say this is a completely new argument. Well, of course, of course Mr. Black takes, mm-hmm. takes the opposite view. Uh, Mr. Black will do his best to buttress the findings of the, of the judge. <laughs> yes, go on. So we've looked at yes. Article 23. Yeah. We've, we've looked at uh, Article 36. Uh, we've got the uh, Article 41. We have the financial services prohibition. So Article 41, subject to, and then a provision dealing with funds, and then Article 42.3 a person shall not carry on a financial services, uh, financial services in or from the DIFC. And we see from uh, sub-article 3 that this is referred to as a financial services prohibition. Uh, and then there is a similar parallel provision below 41A, the financial promotions prohibition, but essentially the same structure of a prohibition and then exemptions from the prohibition applies. Uh, turning over page to Article 42, authorised firms, authorised uh, market institutions. So again, this emphasis on the, the, the notion of authorisation. And the statutory exemption, if I can call it that, comes in 42.3. A person may carry on one or more financial services in or from the DIFP if such person is A, an authorised firm whose licence authorises it to carry on the relevant financial services. So the, clearly the concept there of authorization, um, but by reference to a license. Uh, and similarly, uh, over page little c, an authorized market institution whose license authorizes it to carry on, carry on the relevant financial services. Uh, and then if one tracks through the statute, one has an entire procedure for applying for a license. So that's Article 45, applications for a license. Uh, Article 49, uh, conditions and restrictions on a license. Article 50, withdrawal or suspension of a license or an authorization or endorsement under a license. And then Chapter 5, uh, Article 53, uh, authorized individual and key individual status. I think we can move straight on to the definitions which are found in Schedule 1, which is at page 87 of the internal numbering. Uh, and within the definitions of the statute, we see authorised firm, and defined as a person who holds a licence to carry on one or more financial services, authorised individual, an individual who has been authorised by the DFSA to perform one or more licensed functions for an authorised firm, authorised market institution, a person who is licensed by the DFSA, and finally, for my purposes, authorised person, an authorised firm or an authorised market institution. So again, emphasising authorization uh, and authorized status by reference to uh, a license. That's a, a, a document which licenses someone to do something. We've seen the prohibition and we've seen uh, the uh, provisions for authorization by license. So that's one regime. That's, that's the highest uh, order of regulation. Obviously, the DFSA will want to regulate banks uh, particularly closely, uh, and that's why they are uh, authorized, they need to be licensed, they are heavily regulated, they are subject to conduct of business regulation, they are subject to prudential regulation, so they require to maintain reserves of a certain amount in order to protect consumers uh, within the DIFC. No, none of that sort of regulation applies in respect of recognized members, that's to say banks outside the DFSA who have sought only recognized status. Uh, In terms of registration, which is an interim category, that essentially affects professionals in the DIFC and is an interim 
level of regulation because they're essentially service providers. So lawyers uh, and accountants and auditors are required to be uh, registered. So if one looks at Article 98 in the uh, reg regulatory law, This is in a chapter entitled The Registration of Auditors and Audit Principles. Article uh, 98, Registration, Conditions and Restrictions. The DFSA shall make rules setting out the criteria a person must meet to become and remain registered by the DFSA as a registered auditor or as an audit principal. Uh, and then going back to 71A, Uh, your Lordships may be aware of DNFBPs, those are designated non-financial business or professions, of which lawyers are the most obvious example. They are required, so they, they are subject to a prohibition as well in Article 71A, uh, and there is, they can then be exempted to the extent that they are registered, and in Article 7, 71B, we see the criteria for registration of a DNFBP, that's a designated non-financial business or professional, and the 71C applications for registration. So that, if you like, is the <coughs> intermediary level of uh, regulation and accreditation. And you're saying that this kind of business, the, DNF, the DNFBP, are required the registration? Looking they, require, the they require registration. Uh, a matter which would be well known to law firms who, who have saying to... saying mere recognition would not allow them to carry on the business? Yes, a mere recognition does not allow uh, a bank, for example, to operate a, a, a law firm. The, the recognised member can essentially trade on NASDAQ, uh, but it, what it can't do is um, stray into the business that is reserved to the businesses of uh, DNFPP, uh, which are lawyers and accountants, or, or indeed uh, perform the functions of a registered uh, uh, auditor. And, and then in my list of different categories, we, we come to recognition itself. Uh, my learned friend will develop his points about the pre-2012 pre uh, recognition regime. I, mean, I will say in passing that what mattered under the old regime was a recognition notice. So you had, to be, you had to ensure that you were served with a recognition notice, and that was determinative of your rights uh, uh, in exemption from the uh, prohibition. Uh, there was uh, a register in the old system, but it was not a register of members, it was not a register of bodies, it was a register of grants and revocations. So in, there, was, there was no sense that any person was uh, registered. It was the grant or the revocation of grant uh, that was the registered fact. And under the old system, uh, the registered body or the registered member was exempt from the prohibition, and that much was made clear in the statutory provisions of Article 41, 6 uh, and 7. So LARMAG essentially, and this was the argument rejected by the judge, this I think he referred to as a step-by-step -step approach, uh, LARMAG sought to argue that because they were initially registered under the, or any, the system was originally one of registration, that means that we can consider them now to be registered because there cannot have been any intention for there to be any substantive change when the 2011 amendments uh, were made. Uh, that argument was rejected by the judge. We say it fails anyway because it's the uh, fact of registration that was, sorry, the fact of a grant and fact of a revocation that was uh, registered. Um, and in any event, insofar as there was a change in language, there was clearly a change uh, in the relevant intention. Whilst I'm dealing with recognition, can I um, uh, end one distraction, which is the notion of recognised companies? And there may be some confusion because under the Companies Law 2009 and the Companies Law 2018, Part 11 of the 2009 law, Part 12 of the 2018 law, a company may be recognised to do business in the DIFC. That has got nothing whatsoever to do with the DFSA. Uh, uh, that is simply the recognition under the company's uh, law. And, and indeed, there's uh, reference to various banking cases. 
uh, where it is said that the court assumed jurisdiction over recognised companies, but all of the recognised companies that are referred to were also plainly uh, licensed DIC establishments. So the classic example, Corinth and Barclays, um, Barclays Bank, by reason of having a DIFC branch uh, that was licensed by the DFSA, was found to be a licensed DIFC establishment. So Barclays PLC, Bank PLC in London, because it didn't have a subsidiary, because it didn't have a corporate veil between the parent in London and the branch uh, in the DIFC, uh, the entire bank was found to be a licensed DIFC establishment. So the fact that the, the, the issue is to recognise company status under um, the company's law was not found to be relevant. Now, um, in terms of the change to the uh, legislation, it is worth looking at the consult consultation paper number 76. Uh, that, your Lordship, should have uh, behind tab 14 in the authorities bundle. Sorry, my Lord. I'm going to start at paragraph uh, 9. Sorry, I'm going to start at paragraph 8 and page 5. Thank you. So we've looked at the regulatory statute, which is the, which is the ruler insofar as he's making DRC law. We're now looking at the DFSA, which is the regulator. And this, this section deals with recognition. So the background section, our proposed changes to the recognition regime are proportionate in light of the risks posed to the, DF to the DFC and the DFSA objectives. So because of the limited nature of the trading by a recognised body and a recognised member, there is limited risk to the DIFC, uh, and there is uh, little c an intention that the recognition regime should be aligned with federal law, uh, and also uh, a recognition that recognised members uh, will tend not to be in the DIFC. Indeed, that follows from uh, Article 4 or 5 of the federal law. Uh, and then 9, in summary, the current DFSA recognition regime operates as follows. Uh, A, it permits a non-DIFC exchange and clearinghouse meeting, uh, meeting certain regulatory standards to provide access to the facilities to persons located in the DIFC. Such exchanges and clearinghouses are generically defined as recognised bodies. And B, it permits non-DIFC firms meeting certain regulatory requirements to be remote members of, the, of an AMI in order to trade investments on a DIFC exchange from a place of business outside the DIFC. Such remote members are generally defined as recognised members. So recognised members are banks, essentially, overseas banks, wishing to trade on a DIFC exchange, NASDAQ Dubai, uh, and recognised bodies are exchanges such as the New York Exchange or the Chicago Mercantile Exchange or the Tokyo Exchange, uh, which wants to, to be able to take uh, trades from DIFC customers. And then 10, the persons in A and B are defined as recognised persons. The rationale for the regime is it permits recognised persons to carry on prescribed limited cross-border activities without the need to be authorised or otherwise licensed by the DFSA. So recognition stands outside the authorisation and licensing regime. The DFSA considers that to license such persons would impose a disproportionate regulatory burden. And the reason why recognised persons are outside the authorised and licensing regime is because the, the DFSA does not wish to impose a disproportionate regulatory burden on them. Given that the substantive activities carried on pursuant to their recognition occur outside the DIFC under the laws and supervision of the financial services regulator in their home jurisdiction. And then the rationale is in terms of certainty, uh, exemption from the prohibition. Uh, the recognition is an accepted practice in a number of key jurisdictions where we've explained the background in terms of passporting within the European economic area. And recognition increases market access and liquidity. So the intention is to attract uh, international banks, international exchanges on the, into the DIFC on the basis of limited uh, regulation. Then, interestingly, at 12, the recognition regime which was, was originally passed as a carve-out from the prohibition. 
Uh, this approach was deliberately conservative, reflecting the, nation, the national state of the DFC legal framework. However, our experience and legal analysis have recognised persons to show that, in fact, no financial services carried on by persons in or from the DFC in the ordinary course of their activities, with one exception that we discuss in paragraph 17 below. So a suggestion there that, uh, uh, no, uh, that a recognised person is not, in fact, carrying on financial services in the DIFC. Uh, that, I should say, is the judgment that the judge called into question in his judgment. And the exception uh, is in paragraph 17, so we'll jump to that. However, the DFSA considers that if a recognised member deals on an AMI with a customer who is located in the DIFC, such activity might breach the prohibition because the substantive financial services would take place at least in part in the DIFC. To address this, we propose to restrict the activities of recognised members to dealing with non-DFC customers and DFC customers for whom it deals as a result of an unsolicited request or execution services. From this restriction, we propose to carve out recognised members who are regulated by the financial services regulator in the UAE. So there's a restriction. The exemption is extended uh, only to uh, members, to recognised members trading on behalf of non-DIFC customers uh, on an unsolicited and non-advisory basis. If, however, we're talking about a, a UAE recognised member, um, then they don't even have to satisfy those conditions. Uh, and then picking up at paragraph 15, which is dealing with the structural changes, the legal framework of the recognition regime is currently contained in the regular law 2004, however the regu regulation regime, rec sorry, the recognition regime is fundamentally about access to capital markets and the legal framework for such a uh, regime is more closely aligned to the provisions contained in the markets law, which will be 2011, than the regulatory law. So the recognition regime is being taken entirely outside of the regulatory law and, and is going to be slotted into the markets law into a different statute. So as in terms of the difference of regime, we have an authorization licensing regime and, and a registration regime, which is in the regulatory law, and we have a recognition regime, which is so separate that it's being taken out and put into a different DIFC statute, the markets law. Uh, and then we have an explanation of uh, the financial services prohibition, picking up paragraph 16. Article 41 of the regulatory law currently proposes an exemption for recognised persons from the financial services prohibition. However, given that the legitimate activities of a recognised person under the recognition regime take place materially outside the DIFC, such activities would not normally result in a breach of the prohibition. Therefore, the DFSA considers that the exemption from the prohibition is unnecessary. As a, as a result, we propose to remove it from the regulatory law uh, 2004. The DFSA considers that while there is no doubt that when a recognising recognised member deals with print on AMI, there is a resulting transaction created on the DFC law and on a DFC exchange. This does not necessarily mean that such a person is carrying financial service in or from the DIFC. Well, again, that is the, that's the assessment of the DFSA. The judge, in his judgment, uh, threw doubt on that assessment, that there isn't a financial service carried on in or from the DIFC. And then in terms of the proposed changes to the recognition module of the DFSA rulebook, if I could take the court to uh, paragraph 26 of the consultation paper, uh, internal pagination page 9, the DFSA proposes to create a new recognition model However, the content of the proposed new recognition model is not substantially different from the existing module and is predominantly the layout of the rules that will be changed. For efficiency, we propose to group the rules together on subject matter rather than category of recognised person. Uh, and then picking up recognition criteria, uh, you'll see from paragraph 27 these are to be amended and simplified. And then picking up at paragraph 29, we are proposing to remove from the, R the REC module criteria that are not relevant for the DFSA in its uh, consideration of a recognised person. For example, the requirement relating to fitness and propriety of a recognised body in current REC Rule 3.2.4. The recognition regime is based on reliance by the DFSA on the regulatory framework in the jurisdiction by which the recognised person is located. The DFSA will continue to rely on the licence or other authorisation granted by the financial services regulator of the home jurisdiction, rather than undertaking an independent assessment of the fitness and propriety of the applicant for recognition. And clearly, uh, in terms of light touch, heavy touch regulation, where the regulator is trying to assess the fitness and propriety of those managing an entity, that is relatively heavy touch, that that degree of regulation is being eliminated here 
precisely because the DFSA is relying on the license or the authorization provided by the home state regulator and not by the DFSA, which merely recognizes the relevant entity and lists it as being uh, recognized. That brings us to the markets law, which is behind tab uh, seven. Same bundle? Uh, same bundle, my lord. Well, sorry, Mr. Reed, I have this question before you, I mean, uh, another law. So, you're saying recognition is a completely different recognized regime by this financial bodies and in the financial world and should not be mixed with licensing uh, or registration or authorization, even if they might look the same from a very shadow point of view. Well, we say you can't take that very shallow. We say that Mr. Black's very shallow. You just take the categorization of this. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to say. Recognition might come across authorization sometimes, you say. Recognition might come across registration. Or a look like. However, we should deal with it in a completely separate form because it is. Legally and financially, a separate regime must be recognized yes. as a very yes. independent and separate regime. Yes. That's what we're trying to do. Well, no, we, we say if the draft from the JL said uh, it extends to authorized yeah. firms, he meant firms that are authorized in the technical, not in the sense of broadly construed to mean out. Let me explain let me, let me, let me, let me to you why I'm saying this. Because someone says, being recognized, automatically you are authorized to conduct, to carry on certain business. Can I enter that? You still authorized. Doesn't matter if you recognize or you, whatever, whatsoever happened to you. Yes. Well, that, well that, you know, I, 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 you do. So that I mean, well, this well, is that, a very fine line. That, that's the point. You can say, well, we've got these four categories. So we've got authorization, licensing, registration, and recognition. But broadly speaking, the technical meaning of those words. Authorization means broadly allowed, permitted, and to the extent that you're authorized, you're also authorized in the broader sense of allowed. And we say no, if you're, if you're construing the statutory intention in circumstances where those terms have very technical meanings in the regulatory context, in the context of all of the regulatory statutes, when the draftsman of JL says authorized, he means authorized in the technical sense. When he says registered, he means registered in the technical sense. He doesn't say Recognized, and we say that that permission to say recognition it implies precisely that it was, what was not intended was that recognized members, the foreign banks that just happen to be uh, doing deals on NASDAQ, should be drawn into the party jurisdiction. Yeah, you're saying it's not literally the other three definitions. Yes, recognition is literally not licensing, not registration, not authorization. Yes, because the whole point of being recognized is that you're not authorized. Because you're authorized by your home state regulator. Because authorized is a different concept. A different concept, and you're authorized by someone else. It, it, in essence, it's the authorization by the home state regulator that is being re merely recognized by the DFSA, by the DIFC regulator. We say it's a completely different category, completely different statute. And anyone, uh, any statutory draftsman looking at the DIFC statutes, looking at the DFSA rulebook, it's, it's very clear that these terms are being used in a technical sense. Is good to tab seven. So um, I was going to look briefly at the recognition chapter where it is now found, which is in the markets law. So it's being taken out wholesale and moved into a different statute dealing with the capital, the DFC capital markets. Chapter three, recognition, Article 37, recognised status. And then one, the DFSA shall, by rules, permit an authorised market institution to admit as a member a recognised member. So by reason of being recognised you can be admitted as a member to NASDAQ Dubai. Uh, at two, a person who operates an exchange clearinghouse or alternative trading system from a place of business outside the DFC, the operator, shall not provide direct access to its, facility, to its facilities to persons in the DIFC unless such operator is admitted to the list of recognized persons. So that the exchange, if you like, for example, the New York Stock Exchange, has to be uh, listed as a recognized um, person. It, it is, in a sense, a, a recognized body. And then three makes that distinction between body, I exchange, and member, I bank. 
A recognized body means a person which operates an exchange, clearinghouse, or alternative trading system in a jurisdiction other than the DIFC, which has been admitted to and appears on the list of recognized bodies maintained by the DFSA pursuant to this article. B, a recognized member means a person located in a jurisdiction other than the DFC, which is admitted to and appears on the list of recognized members maintained by the DFSA pursuant to this article. Now, pausing there, one sees the, the word list. So there's no uh, register as such. The word has been changed from register of grants and revocations to a list of recognized persons. Uh, and picking up at four, the DFSA shall maintain a list of recognized bodies and recognized members, the list of recognized persons for the purposes of this article. Uh, and then five, the DFSA may only admit a person to its list of recognized persons if it appears to the DFSA that such a person satisfies and will continue to satisfy the recognition criteria prescribed for the purposes of this article. Six, the DFSA shall by rules prescribe the initial and ongoing criteria which a person must satisfy in order to be and continue to be a recognized person. And there we have the recognition criteria. Mr. Reid, Mr. Reid, uh, assuming this recognized member uh, does something wrong, breaches the, some rules within the IFC, wouldn't it be subject to some form of sanctions? Yes, my lord, it would be excluded from the list. Uh, so, for example, we no, just looked apart, at five apart, apart from being excluded, wouldn't there be a provision to say they'd be fined or something like that? Wouldn't be subject to that? I'm sure they would be. Otherwise, uh, the, FC, the FCA has no control over what they do, except to delist them. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll listen to Mr. Black with interest on that. I'm unaware of any filing. I mean, I, I should say, I, I should explain that in terms of civil jurisdiction, insofar as there's an issue in respect of trading on NASDAQ Dubai, that clearly comes within the contract jurisdiction or the incident. So the 5A1B and the 5A1C jurisdiction under jail. That, that, that much is not disputed. And indeed, uh, to be a member of NASDAQ Dubai, you have to uh, accept the jurisdiction of the DFC courts in respect of your trading in the DFC. Uh, there's, there's, no, there's no question that if, in, if and insofar as FAB was conducting trades as a market maker on NASDAQ, and an issue arose in respect of that, that activity on NASDAQ in the DIFC, that would be subject to DIFC jurisdiction. If, uh, uh, if FAB uh, ceased to satisfy the recognition criteria, and, and I should say five is very clear, the DFSA shall only admit a member to the, to the list of recognized persons if it appears to the DFSA that such a person satisfies and will continue to satisfy the recognition criteria prescribed for the purpose of this article. So you can be removed uh, from the list. Uh, you, your recognition status can be withdrawn, revoked, essentially, if you're no longer found to be someone that satisfies the recognition criteria. And if you're not happy with the removal, you will and, and, to the and indeed, yes, there is a, there's no doubt a procedure for appealing to the FSA, and F, that's because the, the DFSA in the support. The DFSA is a party, then that would break the case. Uh, my Lord, yes. Under the uh, my Lord. And do you think... Uh, the IFC court has uh, judicial review jurisdiction to hear the outcome from the uh, market tribunal? Uh, well, that comes within, doesn't it, the 5A1D from, from memory? E, e, sorry, if judicial review of a, of a body, by reason of being judicial review uh, of, by, of, of a decision by an executive body, but the DFC body is, is subject. Can, can we consider this as a gateway to the IFC to hear that? And to, to hear a judicial view, in so, yes, the, 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 to, in from, so far as the courts are reviewing the, an executive decision, yes. From the decision of the uh, market tribunal regarding to the registration, or recognition, sorry. Well, that, that is an executive decision by a DIFC body that prima facie would be subject to the principles of judicial review. But that, that's a mile away, in my submission, from saying that this court has party jurisdiction over any transaction by FAB in any jurisdiction relating to, relating to any, any matter, merely by reason of the fact that it's recognized with very limited regulation for very limited purposes, um, for the purpose of its, its very limited activities on NASDAQ Dubai. Um, the recognition criteria uh, are also behind tab eight. And they're in 
It's in the REC. Sorry, yeah. it's in the DFSA, isn't it? Uh, yeah, which I, is, I mean, uh, sorry, it's behind it's tab DFSA 8. DFSA rulebook, right? Yes, DFSA rulebook, thank you. So if we could start our uh, perusal of the DFSA rulebook by looking at page 1, internal pagination. So this is the, we're looking now at the recognition model. This is the model, this is the module, sorry, the section of the DFSA rulebook that deals with recognized uh, persons and the recognition regime. And picking up 1.1 uh, sub 4, uh, so this is guidance. Uh, well, certainly 1.1.1, this module applies to every recognized person and to applicants for admission to the list of recognized persons. Uh, and then four, the following parts of the DFSA rulebook shall also apply to recognized persons. So there are only two modules, uh, general and only chapters one and six of that, and enforcement. So in answer to the uh, question of uh, the learned Chief Justice, I suspect uh, if one looks at enforcement, uh, the answer may be there. Uh, and we can do that, or I can certainly look at that while Mr. Black is on his feet. Um, so the recognition criteria are then provided in uh, Rule 2.5. Uh, uh, one, page four, internal pagination. For the purposes of Article 37.6 of the law, the recognition criteria for a recognized member are that A, it's licensed, or otherwise authorized to trade or on or use the facilities of an exchange clearinghouse or alternative trading system in a jurisdiction acceptable to the DFSA. So the DFSA has to have respect and confidence in the uh, home state regulator. Uh, B, it's regulated in respect of trading via financial services regulator to a standard satisfactory to the DFSA. C, the law and practice uh, under which the recognized member is licensed or otherwise authorized is broadly equivalent to the DFSA's regulatory regime as it applies to a DIFC member. Uh, D requires cooperation between the regulators. E requires the recognized member to be acting within the scope of their home state authorization or license. And F carries on business in a jurisdiction other than the DIFC and its head and registered offices are outside the DIFC. And here's the important uh, point for exemption purposes. G, subject to 2.5.3, when dealing on an exchange or alternative trading system in the DIFC, it does so only for, one, non-DIFC customers, or two, DIFC customers for whom it deals as a result of an unsolicited request for execution-only services. So that is a, that's a restriction on the trading of recognized members. But I should say, even a non, even a non UAE recognised member is still allowed by this exemption to trade uh, on the basis of an unsolicited request or providing execution-only services. So the uh, effect of the judgment is potentially uh, binding not only UAE banks but also global banks who have sought and obtained recognised status. Uh, the Exemption from the exemption, if you like, the exemption from the, from the condition to the, the restriction in the exemption is 2.5.3. Rule 2.5.1G does not apply to A, a recognized member which is licensed and supervised by a financial service regulator in the UAE. So that's the carve out from the carve out, if you like. So if one takes the example of a non-UAE recognized member, JP Morgan Securities, for example, insofar as they are trading on NASDAQ Dubai for an American customer who, to whom they provided no advice and who has requested them to effect a trade, we say on the judge's broad approach, it's difficult to see why JP Morgan Securities would not be, uh, on the judge's approach and on, this, on, on LARMAG's approach, would not be authorized or registered uh, on the same basis. Uh, your Lordships have uh, attached to my skeleton a list of the current uh, recognized members. You also have, may have seen the list of the uh, banks trading on NASDAQ, which is a very similar uh, list. Um, essentially, there are 60 um, Banks of those 24 are onshore UAE firms. 
Perhaps it's worth uh, looking at the list uh, which is behind my set of modules. Uh, it's interesting to see that where one has groups, uh, banking groups, so for example, Goldman Sachs uh, has both an authorized entity, Goldman Sachs International, which is based in the DIC, which is authorized, so that has the full, can carry out the full range of financial services uh, in the DIC. But there's another entity, which one suspects is the, essentially the well, higher in the Goldman Sachs hierarchy, that's Goldman Sachs and Co., which is the New York uh, registered entity, and that is merely recognized. So one can infer that the intention is that Goldman Sachs and Co., as a recognized member, can carry out trades on NASDAQ, but by reason of not being authorized, is not going to carry on any uh, more substantial or extensive financial services. It's Goldman Sachs International, it's the DIFC entity, that is, that is authorized and that is going to be carrying on uh, more extensive financial services. So clearly to global financial in to groups, uh, there is real value in having a variated regime with different degrees of regulation and different uh, degrees and regimes of accreditation. And it's very striking that it's only the groups that are in red, uh, so Citigroup, Deutsche, Deutsche Bank, Merrill Lynch and Morgan Stanley that have entities that are both authorised and recognised. Uh, and in, in my submission, that, that is anomalous. Um, they are perhaps institutions that are large enough uh, not to care about the degree of regulation that is imposed by reason of their being not only recognised but also authorised as a separate uh, form of regulation. Uh, as I said, there are only two exchanges on which recognised members can trade, NASDAQ Dubai and the GME. Um, in terms of NASDAQ Dubai, uh, Larmac put in evidence the uh, banks that were members of uh, NASDAQ uh, Dubai. They also explained that there are, uh, that, that on NASDAQ Dubai, one can trade futures on contracts on nine UAE. Uh, companies. Uh, that evidence, I should say, is from 2016. So as of 2016, it, one can, on NASDAQ, trade uh, on contracts uh, on EMAR, ADCB, Aldar, Arabtech, DP World, Dubai Islamic Bank, Etisalat, and Union Properties. So some very big players within the UAE commercial and financial scene were listed on uh, NASDAQ Dubai. That has substantially changed. There are now, is now only one uh, of those entities, DP World, that remains listed. So to that extent, NASDAQ Dubai may be said already to be uh, in decline in terms of the number of major UAE entities that are listed on NASDAQ Dubai. And the reasonable inference is that the, the reason that the global and UA banks that you see in the list uh, attached to my skeleton were seeking recognised member states was precisely to trade in these securities on NASDAQ uh, Dubai. And I explained a moment ago that the, the business rules of NASDAQ Dubai uh, were uh, made clear that uh, there is an opt-in in respect of trading uh, on NASDAQ Dubai. If your logics have bundle E behind tab 6, So you, your lordships have there the, the uh, logos of the various banks that are um, recognised members and trade on NASDAQ. And then you have the NASDAQ Dubai business rules, the rule book. And then if I could take your lordships to rule 3.2 to start with. Sorry, have you, sorry, page 24, bottom right hand corner. So you see a member's continuing obligation. Yes. 3.2.1, a member shall at all times, in respect of each category of membership, which has been admitted, comply with every provision of its membership agreement. 
two, comply with these rules. So you have to comply with the rules. And three, hold an appropriate regulatory license, recognition or authorization. So here again, NASDAQ using these uh, categorizations, defining, distinguishing a license, a recognition and authorization. And I should say too, just, just while looking at it, that if uh, recognition was to be understood within authorization, then uh, there would be no reason to have an opt-in in the contract because by reason of being licensed, recognized or authorized, by reason of being recognized, they would come within the party jurisdiction. So there'd be no, no need for a 5A1A party jurisdiction because if the judge were right, then the fact of being recognized would mean there was already 5A1A and therefore there was no need for 5A2 opt-in, uh, which is what we see uh, going back a couple of pages to page 21 Rule 220, Governing Law, uh, these rules shall be governed by and construed in accordance with the laws of the DFC, and each member irrevocably submits to the exclusive jurisdiction of the DIFC court. So insofar as a member is acting, uh, is complying with the rules, uh, those rules and its compliance is subject to the exclusive jurisdiction of the DIFC court. That is an opt-in within 5A2 uh, in respect to the activities of a recognised member in accordance with the uh, NASDAQ Dubai business rules. Now the consequence of uh, being a limited, being a recognised uh, member is that the financial services that one can carry out pursuant to the exemption uh, in the rule book are, are limited. So if one looks at um, the general module, which is behind tab 9 of the authorities bundle, and if one looks at a uh, uh, rule Nine, sorry, Rule 2.2.1 of the uh, general module to which recognised members are subject. Well, sorry, are not subject. But you'll see uh, 2.2.1, an activity constitutes a financial service under regulatory law and these rules where, and then it's, if it's one of categories in 2.2.2, .2, and then your lordships will recognise these as very broad categories of financial service, so accepting deposits, well that's not something that a recognised member is doing. Providing credit, uh, that's similarly not something a recognised member can do. Similarly, uh, providing money services. Uh, D, dealing in investments, is something that what they would be doing uh, on NASDAQ insofar as they were market making. Dealing in investments as agent, well they would be market making on their own account, so that doesn't, doesn't count. Arranging deals in investments, that is something they can't do. Managing assets, none of the recognised members or recognised bodies are managing assets. Advising on financial products, or the limited advisory to the extent that the UAE banks uh, have the carve out from the condition in 2.5.1G. Uh, managing a collective investment fund, well, the recognised members aren't able to do that either. And one can go down this list, essentially, these are the core financial services. Uh, one, only one or two of which can be carried out uh, by a recognised member pursuant to the relevant e exemptions. And the sections of the DFSA rulebook to which recognised members are not subject is also uh, very striking. The anti-money laundering, the AML module, uh, they are not subject to that. They're no doubt regulated in terms of anti-money laundering by their home state regulator. The AUD, the audit module, they're not subject to that. They're not subject to the conduct of business rules in the COB manual module, uh, nor the collective investment rules in the CIR model, nor the uh, prudential uh, modules, prudential investment and banking module. All of that conduct of business regulation, all of that prudential regulation, all of that anti-money laundering regulation is done uh, by their home state uh, regulator. Uh, and if one looks too at the uh, fees that are charged by the DFSA for the uh, recognition 
of uh, recognised members, they too are very low and they reflect the light touch of the regulation being applied. So if you look behind tab 11 in the same bundle, So 2.1.1, an applicant applying for a licence authorising it to carry on financial services has to pay fees according to the table. And so the, if, if, we were, if a, an authorised or licensed uh, institution is accepting deposits or providing credit, it has to pay 70,000 US dollars for uh, its, its licence. Uh, going to 2.1.2, .2, if you are an exchange and you're seeking to be authorised, you have to pay an application fee of 150,000 uh, US dollars. Uh, and then if you're going to 2.3, if you're applying to be registered as an auditor, you are paying an application fee of $7,000. And then if you're applying for 2.6 recognition, well, as an exchange, you're paying, paying 15,000, which is uh, a, a fraction of what you'd be paying if you were seeking to, a license to operate as, a, as an exchange. But an application for recognition as a recognized member, so that's the overseer of the global banks and the UA banks, their application fee is 1,000 US dollars, which is almost a nominal amount. And then turning to page 11, internal pagination, we have the annual fee. So having paid the application fee every year, you have to pay an annual fee. Uh, and again, the fees for authorised firms, so they're authorised by licence, 3.2. You have to look at the table, page 12, internal pagination. And a, a, an authorised firm is paying 100,000 US dollars per year for its uh, regulation. 3.4, an authorised market institution is paying 100,000 for its annual uh, reg uh, regulation, uh, and indeed 200,000 if it's both an exchange and a clearinghouse. And I think I can go straight on to recognise bodies uh, at 3.12. This is the recognition rate, recognised body 3.12.2, a recognised body must start the initial period to pay to the DFSA an annual fee of $1,000. That's only since this year. And we see from the guidance that recognised members do not have to pay any annual fee. So they are paying, a, a, an international global bank that is a mere recognised member is paying nothing on an ongoing basis in respect of its recognised and its regulations. So we say there is a consistent regulatory uh, framework with different categories of accreditation. If you're authorised, uh, you, you are able to provide a full range of financial services. You're subject to all of the modules of the DFSA rulebook, and you're paying significant fees to the DFSA for your regulation. If, on the other hand, you are merely recognised, there's a very limited range of financial services, essentially trading on NASDAQ. Uh, which is subject to very strict conditions, except for UAE firms. You are subject to very limited sections of the DFSA rulebook, and you are paying minimal and indeed zero fees to the DFSA in the, in the case of a recognised member. And we say against that background, if one puts oneself and one is looking at the shoes, looking at sorry the draftsman of the, the JAL, uh, in extending party jurisdiction to licensed DIFC establishments, and one, one can infer a certain amount from the, from the, from the term licensed DIFC establishments, yes. but, but we say it's clear that that jurisdic jurisdiction is extended to entities that are licensed in the sense of Marcas, registered in the sense of Musajal, and authorised in the sense of Musarah Lachal. That those are, that the Arab draftsman in using those Arabic terms was tracking precisely the categories of regulation and accreditation that are established throughout the uh, DIFC statutory regime and indeed throughout the DIFC regulatory regime. Well, Mr. Reid, I think one of the problems, maybe with, with your submission, maybe before the judge below even, you try to distinguish recognition by a different meaning of the words like listed in the uh, uh, law number 16. And it's just saying recognition did not exist at all 
under the definition of a licensed establishment. I, th I think there is kind of mixing between, when, we, when you try to argue that, like, what does this word mean, or what does, what does that word mean? And instead, you could have said, recognize it's never been listed under what so-called, uh, or what can be a DRC establishment. Well, that, that, that is what we say. We say, when you look at the definition of DRC, licensed DRC establishment, and at a time when it was clear in the regulatory law, when the same law was being drafted, or when regulatory law was being drafted as a DRC statute, and there was going to be provision in the regulatory law for licensing, authorization, registration, and recognition, for the draftsmen in the uh, JL to use license authorized, registered, uh, but not uh, recognized, that was a deliberate omission. He intended not to extend the party jurisdiction under 5A1A to recognize members. And you think the Arabic text support this idea? Uh, and I say, no, it's I, not I, even I, in Arabic. And I, none of the Arabic word would contain what can be called a recognized. That's what you can say. That's what you're trying to say. Uh, that is what I am, I am saying. Yes, I, clearly the JL had to be in Arabic. But uh, to suggest that the draftsman of the JL, albeit an, an, an Arab draftsman, was using the word authorized in a broad way, and using the word registered in a broad way, uh, and had no, there was no link between that and what the English draftsman, English language draftsman, was doing in terms of the regulatory law, and the DFSA was, was thinking in terms of the rule book, to say that there's no match at all, there's no tracking, and that the Arab draftsman was just using the word authorized in a very general sense, we say makes no sense in terms of trying to construe the uh, JAL. And, and what the mistake, the, the error in, in the judge's reasoning is, is to say that because uh, Lamag hadn't sought to uh, put sufficient evidence in terms of translation, therefore, ergo, I am required to give it a broad translation, merely because of the extent of the evidence before me, that determines the construction that I'm going to give to the JAL. In our submission, that's simply the, the, the wrong approach. You have to look at the legislative intention by reference to the statutory framework, by reference to the entire regulatory regime that was being put in place at the, at the same time. And we say to consider that the draftsman of the jail didn't have in mind uh, that statute and, and that context and was not, didn't have in mind those categories which were clearly being uh, uh, established in the regulatory law, which were being used consistently in the DFSA handbook, uh, in our submission makes no sense in seeking to construe the definition of uh, licensed DRC establishment and DRC establishment. We say, albeit that the draftsman had to be using Arabic because it's, an, because it's a Dubai statute, uh, he was seeking to track precisely the categories of status that exist under the statutory regime in the DRFC and indeed the regulatory regime in the DRFC. Uh, so that, that's why we say it's not enough to uh, adopt an autonomous approach. The word autonomy suggests that you don't have to look at the historical and the regulatory context. And indeed, it, it, it's defined in one of uh, the Lamag's submissions as being uh, autonomous in being not by reference to later DRC legislation or statutes, uh, statements, sorry, of the DFSA. So you, you're, you're told to construe the JEL and those very precise words without any regard uh, to DRC legislation and DFSA statements. And that, we say, would be very wrong in terms of try, trying to construe the JAL. The, the flaws go deeper because we say, we start by saying that actually evidence of the Arabic was available uh, to the court. Uh, there were dictionaries that made very clear that authorization in the sense of has a distinct meaning and is more narrow uh, than uh, was being suggested, merely meant permitted or allowed in some general sense. And we say too that insofar as issues of translation go to a question of Dubai law, uh, the court is perfectly entitled to receive uh, submissions as to how the JL should be translated and understood. So to simply take a rather English viewpoint, which is, well, I haven't at this stage, on a very truncated procedure, had experts, I'm able to cross-examine experts, 
And on that basis, I have to adopt a broad approach, regardless of whether that was actually the intention of the draftsman of the JL. Uh, we say is flawed, and it's not only flawed, it's flawed uh, at a number of, of levels. And we say when you're trying to ascertain the legislative intention, the safest guide uh, is always going to be uh, related statutes relating to it and the regulatory regime that arises out of those statutes. The JL, I should say, is a special case in terms of construction. Uh, strangely, given that it's a Dubai statute and that it's in Arabic, it's the DIFC court, an English-speaking court, that has exclusive jurisdiction under Dubai uh, Law Number no. 9 of 2004 to construe the JL. And we know that because the um, judges of this court, insofar as they give judgments in the JJC, uh, consistently refer to the fact that it's, it's actually the DIFC court that has that clear uh, uh, statutory uh, exclusive jurisdiction under uh, Dubai Law 9, the, the, the DIFC uh, law. The, uh, as we've seen, there is a, a, an authoritative, I, I, I use that word at least, an authoritative English translation that is provided by the DIFC court, which is the one that's behind in, in Milan and Friends Authorities Bundle, which is reliably uh, and, and commonly used by parties before this court in advancing submissions. They don't, they don't advance submissions by reference to the Arab statute, and if, in fact, if it seems impossible to find an Arabic version of the consolidated uh, JAL. Uh, there's only one case of which I'm aware in, in which an error has been identified in that English translation, and you'll be aware of the Deer and Waterfront Properties case to which Milan and Friend will refer, <coughs> and it was suggested in that case that it was enough that a DIFC body was involved uh, in, a, in, a, in a claim in order for there to be party jurisdiction and uh, the court in Deer identified that the words tarifan fiha as a party involved as a party in it had been dropped out of the English translation and so to that extent there was corrective proper corrective construction by the DIFC court that's the only case in which it's been suggested and he found that there was an error in the standard English translation of the The JEL has been obviously consolidated and amended uh, insofar as uh, the, uh, either the earlier statute or the consolidated statute has been translated in English. I am aware of only one case. I'm grateful for this. I'm grateful for clarification. Uh, no, my learned friend may have been involved in DIA. But um, uh, that is the only occasion. What we now are told is that when one looks at the definition of licensed DLC establishment, there are three mistakes uh, in the Arabic. Uh, and this seems to be a suggestion that we must uh, discard any confidence in the standard uh, English uh, translation. In our submission, uh, that, that, is, that is wrong. As a matter of English... So would you, would you make the, I mean, this recent I mean, argument clear? I don't understand. Or where the criticisms comes from, the three Arabic words? Um, well, in, in so what, what I'm told, you said, who it, told you? Well, in my friends, their skeleton, and indeed their submissions, they say that the word mashrua should be translated as project, not entity. And they say that insofar as um, there's references to registered, authorised and licensed, they say there's, well, actually, there's al oh. al between the two of them, or all. So even though comma, or, in English, would be the same as al, al, in Arabic. That is said to be a mistake. I didn't see there is the relevant definition with various underlinings said to identify a total of three areas of translation in the standard English uh, translation of Article 2, the definition of licensed DRC establishment. Uh, in fact, we, in our submission, Arabic is a remarkably precise language. When one takes a word like permitted, we'll look at the the dictionary, the Arab dictionary, text is permitted. There are a number of uh, Arabic words that can be used to capture a number of different shades of meaning that all come within the English term permitted. So if anything, it's, it's the English language that is broader uh, and, and less precise. Well, Mr. Reed, I think sometimes, I might, personally, I have the doubt what, whether this law was it, like drafted first in English and then translated in the purpose of Ushua in the Gazette in Arabic, Lord, I didn't, I, or is the other way around? I hesitate to make that submission. Um, yeah, but when you, yeah. I like to make these comments 
That is what happens in Malaysia. We have two laws. That we have laws in English as well as in our national language. Uh, although the law provides that the the, the text, the, Malaysia, the Malaysian national language text, is the authoritative text, but in practice, draftsmen drafts in English yes. and translate into yes. the national language. I'm not saying that it happens in Dubai. I'm just uh, I'm saying just sharing this my experience with you. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, I, I will I will say this: there was a team of very brilliant bankers, lawyers, financiers. Uh, policy people who were setting up the DIC in the early 2000s and they came from all different nations and they were, I have little doubt that English was the language in which they were communicating in designing, conceiving and building and structuring the DIFC. Yes, so, they have no, and they have not bear in mind that we'll be sitting here today discussing the world this Discussing the retranslation <laughs> of their English into Arabic and how we should re retranslate it back from Arabic back, right. into, back into English. <laughs> which is, which, uh, in my, which in my speech suggests that the, the standard English uh, translation may well uh, have been close to the uh, original conception, uh, which doesn't change I, the I, fact I, that. I'm sorry. Lord. Yes. No, no. I was just thinking, how long more are you going to take, Mr. Reed? Um, how long more you uh, you you are going to, to take? I will try and take half an hour. No, I'm not, I'm not rushing you. Please, I'm not rushing you. I'm just, just having an... an uh... Thank you for your assurance. I've, I've given a very generous indication by Mr. Black that he, he may be able to compress his submission to an hour. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so uh, hopefully he won't take as long as, as I'm... I, I, just, I, I just want to... Uh, the reason why I ask you is we judges are all people, then we uh, may have uh, to take a break so I'm just asking my colleagues there on the bench whether, you know, how long more you are going to take, whether we can, you know, continue for whatever number, half in, how many number of minutes so you, you need. Well, optimis so optimistically, that, my Lord, half an hour, um, maybe as much okay. as an hour, if we need to discuss. So my, my learned friends on the bench, uh, can we last for another hour? <laughs> no, an hour. I would say 20 minutes, maybe, or something. <laughs> no, no, the, 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 the council requires one hour. I don't, I don't want to rush him through the submission. So, Judge Omar and Judge Ali, if you, I don't know, I leave it to you. If you, uh, we can continue, I have no problem. What do you have to say to Perhaps that? We break. Perhaps we should break for 10 minutes. If we'll or, uh, yes, then, then we'll take a break 10 minutes. Then uh, we'll yes. resume. Yeah. Okay, let's do that. Let's take a 10-minute break now. It's, it's uh, 12 o'clock by my time. You are, what, 2 p.m.? No, 3 p.m. You are 3 p.m. 3 p.m. So... What is uh, your 3 p.m.? Yeah, no, no. Now it's 3 p.m. Your time. Dubai time. So 10 past 3. Okay. So 3, 10 so, will resume. Where? Well, 10, 10, 10, 15 minutes. Okay? Uh, judge, judges. Okay. Can you let me know when you're ready? I'll be here. Fine. I'll be in this room. I'm not going anywhere. Okay, let's Thank take you. a 10 minute or 15 minute break. Thank you very much. Take the microphone off, please. Yes. Yeah, Mr. Reed. During the break, I was we were, I was discussing with my colleagues. I think uh, you have heard, put clearly your points already, and we understand you well your points. So uh, perhaps you can speed up or you know uh, wrap up what you're trying to say. I mean, what you want to say. You have already gone through, and we understand very very clearly what you are submitting. Okay, well, I'll, I'll try and not repeat any submissions, but I, but I do need to make clear what I want to say, uh, both as a matter of Arabic language and also in terms of what I've called in the skeleton the unintended consequences, if you like. 
Um, as a matter of language, I should say the same problem exists in English. There is a difference of meaning. If I say, uh, are we allowed to swim on that beach, that means something entirely different from, are we authorised to swim on, on that beach? If we're allowed, it means there's no negative prohibition. Am I authorised to swim on the, that beach means have I got authority, am I licensed, have I got a, am I authorised specifically in respect of uh, that beach? And we say that the onus is on Lama to show that the Arabic, Musarah Lahu, means uh, not authorised uh, but allowed in, in the broader sense. We say that that as, a, as an issue, both a translation and as an issue of uh, Dubai law is one which the court uh, can consider without uh, expert evidence. You'll be aware of the Fidel and Felicia case. Uh, I think uh, at least one of the current court appeal was in, involved in that case, sitting in that case. But essentially, uh, Chief Justice at the time, Michael Huang, identified a number of approaches to issues of foreign law. The English approach, where it had to be dealt with by way of an expert report. The Talim approach, where you look at the composition of the bench and if the judge in question has the relevant expertise and experience, then they don't need expert evidence. And the international approach by which you can uh, look at foreign law issues by way issues of submission by way of... And, not, not, and not by way of fact. And the preference emerging from that decision is clearly the international approach uh, whereby the court can receive submissions. Uh, but e even if one takes the Talim approach, uh, the court, uh, if it has the relevant expertise and experience, can decide uh, issues of foreign law, in this case, Dubai. So for the judge to say that because there was no uh, insufficient expert evidence, uh, therefore he had to adopt a specific approach to construction, we say that was flawed uh, as a matter of Fidel and Felicia. Yeah, but, but the, the judge was just relying on what was said in Corinth. That's all. In, an, in, uh, in a way, he, he was bound by, by Corinth because he was a court first instance on well, how to Corinth, interpret. Uh, Co uh, well, Corinth assumed the, uh, the English approach. Sorry, it's Karafi. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. assumed the English Corafi, approach. Karafi, Karafi. Sorry, Karafi is not. not uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Harrison. Assumed yes. the English approach. Since then, in the Court of Appeal, uh, Chief Justice Michael Huang entirely changed the approach to evidence. He, adopt, he essentially said that the court ought to adopt an international approach. Now, the reality is that the court has not entirely adopted. So, for example, the Nest Investments, the first instance judgment, there was very substantial expert evidence and expert cross-examination in respect of the Lebanese law of authority. So you don't have to follow the international approach, but neither is the court bound by the English approach which was the dominant approach at the time of the uh, Kharafi judgment. So we say, as a matter of general approach, the court was entitled uh, and is entitled uh, to consider issues of Dubai law and to consider issues of translation of Dubai statutes um, by reference to the experience and expertise. It's not uh, forced, uh, its hand is not tied by, fact, by reason of the fact that on a truncated pr procedure, it doesn't have expert evidence uh, before it. In any event, the court had, um, uh, and I should say in terms of uh, translation, the issue is a relatively short one. It's whether uh, musara lahu uh, means permitted in the broader sense or means authorised. And um, as I say, we say that is something to which the international approach could be applied, and it's certainly not the case that by reason of there being insufficient expert evidence, uh, one is obliged to take a particular uh, translation, particularly if that is the wrong tr uh, translation. Um, there was indeed uh, evidence before the court on the translation issue. Um, in tab 20, behind tab 21, in the authorities bundle. Uh, yeah, your, your authorities. My, my authorities bundle. We have the uh, translations provided uh, by Google Translate. It's easy to be flippant about Google, but the reality is it offers an excellent translation. And many practitioners uh, block text and put it into Google Translate and, and find a very uh, helpful translation. The, the translation for Musara Lahu is authorized. And what is said by Lamag is that uh, if, you, if you mean authorized, use the word uh, Mukhawal. 
or Mahwal, and Mahwal is also uh, said by Google Translate to be authorized, and I apologize for my uh, pronunciation. Because uh, it's a two different meaning. My lord, well, yeah. my lord, yes. <laughs> but my lord, it's clear from Google Translate that Musarah Lahu has that sense of... Yeah, again, the Arabic uh, word here, it depends to the sentence, actually. Musarah Lahu or Mukhawal Lahu, it depends to the sentence. You have to read the full sentence mm. to get the, the proper meaning mm. of the single word. Mm. So, uh, as you uh, uh, earlier said, the Arabic word Musarah Lahu, Masmuh Lahu, is very wide in Arabic uh, rather than an English uh, version of uh, Jal. Mm. So I don't know how it will help you in your, in your submission. Well, I, I'm, as, as an Arabic speaker, uh, Jal, your Lordship has, my, my, your Lordship has enormous advantage of being a, being a native speaker, which... But, so my definition will be, is, could be different than yours, in, in Arabic word. Well, my Lord, that, when I read it, a full sentence with uh, that, one word. That, it seems to me, is the consequence of Fidel and Felicia, and indeed the Talim approach, the judges who have relevant expertise and experience of uh, Dubai law are entitled to receive submissions and consider those submissions by reference to their own experience and expertise. Uh, I mean, but there are clearly two issues. There's the issue as to what that mean, word means ordinarily, and where there's any doubt as to what that word means ordinarily, you have to look at the framework, you have to look at the, the background in terms of construing what the word means in its context and the context here, the legislative purpose, we say, is by reference to the surrounding statutes. Well, Mr. Reid, in your opinion, how wide the word authorized means compared to license and the register? You might tell me it is very wide. Is that right? No. My Lord, Co compared to registered and licensed. Uh, authorized compared to. Well, when the word authorized is almost always coupled with license. So if you look at the statutes, it's always authorized by license. In, 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 in reality, so, sorry to interrupt, but you connect authorized with license, must, you have license to authorize. Well, when one looks at the framework, when one looks at the statutes, when one looks at the way that authorization is used, it always tends to be authorized by license. So the same entity could be said but to be authorized. But I just ask you from a very general linguistic uh, from basis. From a very general linguistic we say the word authorized is narrow and specific and has a technical meaning. And we say that the word allowed or permitted has What's a your evidence in this, apart from being an Englishman? Well, apart, well uh, the word authorized. Yes. Well, because, I said, what is your evidence for what you've well, just said? Well, here, here, I'm saying as a matter of construction, the word authorized, uh, as in my understanding of the language in which I am a native speaker, is it authorized by reference to a specific authority. By a specific authority. authority. Are you authorized to do this? Do you have authority to do this? Is there a document? Is there a license that authorizes you to do that? Then again, we go and check what authority stands for, and then we go and I mean, enter into a mean and different meaning as well. Exactly, it's, it's, I don't know, even licensing, it's a licensing authority or licensing body. So license will be usually given or granted again by someone. Yes. Uh, and in this context, we have the DFSA rulebook, which sets out, for, sets out the terms and conditions for the licensing of banks and financial institutions. And th those are the license, licenses in question. And, uh, and I, I would submit that that is the, clearly the intention when one's talking about a licensed DIFC establishment. Is, is, has the relevant body been licensed or been granted a license, if you want to put it that way? And yes, that is a technical meaning. And insofar as they are licensed and have a license, they have been authorised. And that, and that equivalence between licensing and authorization, in my submission, is very clear when one looks at the provisions of the regulatory law, the markets law, and the DFSA uh, rulebook. And it exists but it's also in not, England. It's also, it's also not wrong to say permitted by law. It's also well, not wrong to say permitted well, by well, law. Well, my, my it doesn't have to be authorized by I law. Accept that the, mm -hmm. I accept that the word permitted uh, it, it sort of goes both ways in that you could say, am I permitted to go to the beach, meaning am I allowed to go to the beach, yeah. and am I permitted in the sense of am I authorised to go to the beach. It's like what's first, uh, the but, egg but or the, the chicken? But the judge in saying... It's so really just like the question of the chicken first or the egg first. <laughs> Which comes first? Well, the chicken and egg implies a circularity. In, in, in my submission, there isn't that circularity because... If you are authorized, you are specifically authorized. If you are allowed to do something, you're not prohibited from doing something. It's a broad, it's a much broader concept. 
And that's just a matter of, of English. And of course, uh, your lordship is then, and the, the learned deputy chief justice is then entitled to say, well, as a matter of Arabic, I understand Musarah Lahu to mean more permitted, as you understand permitted in English, than authorised, as you understand authorised in English. But that assessment has to be not only as a matter of Arabic language, but also construction of the Arabic language by reference to the context, which I think uh, His Excellency was also accepting that you, to some extent in Arabic, if you're trying to define Musarah Lahu, you have to look at the whole sentence, you have to look at the context. And we say the context in this context is the, is the entire regime providing for an authorization regime, a registration regime, and a recognition regime. So what can be said to Arabic can be applicable to the English warning we have in hand now. We have three. I said what can be said to, uh, to the dis difference me different meaning of Arabic yeah. words that come under the Arabic version of Jal can be exactly said to the similar wording being given in English. Each of them stands for itself. It might have another meaning it's, provided it's, by it's entirely, another authority. It's already. entirely true. It's, in, it's entirely true that if you, if the Article Two of the JL had said authorized, uh, had been in English, and had used the words licensed, authorized, and registered, you could, Mr. Black, could stand up and, and say with a straight face that authorized in that context means generally allowed, generally or permitted. Uh, I, I would say that's wrong. I would say that when you're construing those terms, uh, accepting that there may be ambiguity, if you're construing them in their context, then authorization has a specific technical meaning. Registration has a specific technical meaning. Recognition has a specific technical meaning. <coughs> and when the draftsman of the JL is using those technical words in that context, they are precisely picking up the differences between the different regimes that is provided in the statutory framework and in the regulatory regime. Obviously, I've got the further stage of the argument, which is that the, the, the JL isn't in English, it's in Arabic. But in our submission, Musarah Lahu is picking up authorization, Musajal is picking up registration, and Tarkhas is picking up, sorry, um, Narkhas is picking up the idea of um, licensing. Um, and so, and as, as we have said, uh, and uh, I mean, to some extent, um, uh, hesitantly making submissions as to the meaning of Arabic to, 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 this, to this bench, but we say that if you, in Arabic, if you intend to capture the broader sense, you would have used, the draftsman would have used the word, words such as masmuh bi, like the sense of permitted in the, in the broader sense. And we note that to that extent Google agrees with us that masmuh uh, li uh, is translated by Google not as authorized but as permitted, which seems to capture that broader sense. That, that was a, perhaps a, a, a trivial submission by reference to Google, but we backed that up in a further submission when we went to one of the leading uh, legal Arabic dictionaries, of Farouki's dictionary, um, which is published by the Libre du Liban in Beirut. We have that behind uh, tab 19 in our authorities bundle. And if your lordships uh, look at in the, uh, in the Arabic, so Arabic to English at page 321. And if, you, if I could take you to the bottom right hand, bottom of the right hand column, Musarah. So allowable, authorized, and then Musarah Lahu, the, the second, and indeed it says Al Muhawal Lahu, empowered to give orders, act as an attorney. Uh, licensed or authorized. So we, uh, we say that's precisely the meaning that the draftsman of the JL was intending to catch. And empowered, obviously, in the sense of a power of attorney, an express licensing or author authorizing document. And then if one uh, turns over one tab to tab 20, we have uh, Professor Farouki's English to Arab dictionary. And we have authority, and you see there tasri, which is obviously the same jizr root, three-letter root, as musarah lahu. And similarly, and I'm struggling to read some size, uh, tahwil. So again, 
the word which is said to be by Lamag to be a narrow definition of authority, Mukhawal, the same word from the same root, Tahwil, is also translated as authority, but as is uh, Tasri. And then going down to authorized, halfway down the left hand column, uh, Yahwalu, so again, yeah. uh, but similarly, Yasrahu. So Yasrahu from Musara, the same Jizra as Musara Lahu, is also being used as to authorize. And perhaps most uh, uh, relevantly, authorized capital, Rasmal, uh, can be Rasmal uh, Musara Bi. So again, authorized in the sense of an authorized capital being specifically authorized, and Musara being used as the word to connote uh, specific authorization. And indeed, if one turns over page to page 521, English Arabic, we have permit, and uh, the first Arab word used for that is yasma. So again, the broader sense of allow or, or permit. And if your lordship has the, or your lordships have the a learned friend's skeleton argument, Uh, a similar assertion is made by Larmac of translate as to translation. So if your logic looks at page your logic to look at page seventeen. Mm-hmm. And you look at the final paragraph paragraph sixty seven. Yes. Furthermore the appellants again fail to consider the Arabic language text of jail which uses the word misajal, a popular online Arabic dictionary definition of the noun, tasjil is certain factual proof in an official record. So what is being suggested there is that the dictionary translates sajal not as register, but as, but as record. But actually, the dictionary in question is an Arab to, Arab, Arabic to Arabic dictionary. And you see the Arabic definition in footnote 48. Unfortunately, the word order appears, appears to have been reversed. But essentially, it says, if that's fi sajal rasma, so proof in an official register, because sajal obviously comes from the same jizr, sajala, as musajal. So the definition of uh, a registration is something appearing on an official register. So an entirely circular and unhelpful definition, but which is relied on by way of uh, Lamag's own translation to seek to suggest that register, musajal, means just recorded in a broad sense, and therefore that listing is sufficient for the purpose of coming with the definition of Musajal. That, uh, we submit, is an entirely yeah, wrong translation. Sajala to register means to register. Musajal means registered, means included on an official register. Looking at... So, register is not our word anyway, in any way. So, we, we, we focus in authorized. Uh, that well, the, well, the, the, point, the, main, well main. the judge does say that... Again, he doesn't rely on it, but he does say in passing that insofar as they are listed as a recognized member, but he is satisfied that that, is, that, that, is there, that they are registered. And I can take your lordship um, to that briefly. So if one picks up, for example, <coughs> paragraph 38 eight of the judgment. 38? 38, yes. So adopting this approach, I conclude that by virtue of the DFC entering the names of respondents list of recognized members, thereby entitling to trade on NASDAQ to buy as members of that exchange with DFC customers free of limitations contained in uh, Rule 2.5.1G. Each of the respondents is authorized and or registered. So by reason of being listed, they are registered. Uh, that's, that's his reason. That, that we say is what's... But he did that in English basis even, not in Arabic basis. Well, yes, it, it, it's the same argument. Yes, I mean, he, I, I, he, he appears to have accepted uh, the assertive translation on the footnote uh, and, and found that uh, registered massajal in the Arabic uh, includes, would include listing because register is to be given the broad definition of record. And as long as they're recorded in the list, that is sufficient on his analysis uh, to find that they are registered. Well, we, we obviously descent from that analysis.
In terms of the legislative approach, sorry, the legislative intention, I think I've, I've made myself clear. I'm not going to repeat what I've, what I've said there in terms of uh, the context, in terms of the different categorization. Uh, the differences in, in uh, the differences we say are more obvious in this case because one has or, or, or between the two, or or, or in the Arabic, between the uh, different categories of uh, regime. Uh, I've explained, pursuant to your Lordship's remarks in respect of how the uh, JL may have originated, that in our, it seems likely that there was a single team uh, that was uh, involved both in setting up the regulatory framework and in terms of subjecting um, activities in the DIFC uh, to common law jurisdiction and the establishment of the common law courts and establishing the jurisdiction of the common law courts. And just as one sees uh, in certain categories heavier regulation on the regulatory side, uh, one sees in, in my submission uh, evidence that they are clearly to be within the jurisdiction. So an authorized or a licensed uh, uh, body of a member uh, is or entity establishment is more likely to be, it's clearly subject to the DIFC court a jurisdiction. And similarly, where there is a lesser DIFC interest, one sees lighter regulation and, it, and, and an exclusion of recognition from the party jurisdiction of the uh, DIFC court. And as I've said, we're not excluding NASDAQ trading. To the extent that an entity, say an American bank, is trading on NASDAQ in the DIFC, it would entirely accept that it is subject to DIFC court jurisdiction in respect of its trading. What it would not accept is that it's subject to the mandatory and exclusive jurisdiction of the DIFC court in respect of all of its activities elsewhere in the world. And one looks at those banks, looks at the, um, the fraction of the trading that will be, is likely to be done on NASDAQ, in Dubai NASDAQ, compared to their global trading. The, the idea that they would have understood uh, that uh, all of their activity is subject to DIC jurisdiction, party jurisdiction. Melania Friend will take a point about, I think, one of the early Court of First Instance judgments, the suggestion that exclusive jurisdiction in 5A1 doesn't mean exclusive jurisdiction. It only means exclusive jurisdiction, I think it's Sir John Chadwick, when it's talking about Dubai in, in Dubai law. But uh, with respect, that isn't what the statute says. And when one looks at the exercise in statutory construction as provided in the lease case, the lease and Elskett case, and the adult and frontline development, there are two points to that, uh, to what he said in respect of the law of DIC construction. First of all, that you look at the legislative intention. But second of all, that the court isn't in a position to rewrite the statute. The court can't simply ignore, for example, words in the statute. And by saying that the DIC court statute is mandatory and exclusive, only... Uh, by reference to, um, to Dubai uh, jurisdiction. Uh, in, in our submission, you, you are simply writing out the word uh, exclusive jurisdiction. The statute says the DIFC court shall have exclusive jurisdiction. Now, wh whether courts outside Dubai are going to take any notice of the jail is another question. But as a matter of DIFC law, to seek to construe the JAL such that it doesn't really affect mandatory jurisdiction or exclusive jurisdiction or, and doesn't and only, only provides for exclusive jurisdiction where the rival jurisdictions, the DIC, is, uh, I would suggest, a, a dangerous construction, is dangerous in terms of the principle, the wider principles of statutory construction. Well, Mr. Reid, I think that maybe it's, it might work well when it's come to the regulatory law, I mean, or where, or where they want to put themselves so under what kind of supervision, but when it's come to the, I mean, judicial jurisdiction, the things are completely different because they, even your firm or any, 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 any financial firm in the world can come, can become subject of the jurisdiction of this court or any other work, disregard to whatever regulatory regime they are under, because the, the link to any, I mean, jurisdiction, uh, judicial jurisdiction, can be completely different. I mean, you need yes. to. Not to link, I mean, the jurisdictional uh, I mean, ground to the regulatory grounds. Well, but well, people do want to be bound by certain regulatory, let's say, complexities, because maybe to be a registered or licensed, you need to have an office in the DFC, you have to pay rent in the DFC, you have to pay that much of money to be registered or licensed in the DFC. 
But however, not, not to be subject to discord, it's, I, I would fall completely under, I mean, diff, different category, different bases, different uh, different issues. Well, no, because you're looking at a license, you're looking at the definition of licensed DIT establishment, you add, which then uh, extends the party jurisdiction, which is a broad jurisdiction, by reference to a very specific category, and I'm sorry if I'm repeating myself, but authorization, registration, um, and, and licensing, we, we say those are, those are technical definitions. They would, have been un, they would have been understood by the banks uh, seeking recognised status. They would have been understood as clearly, uh, refer, clearly linked to the party jurisdiction. Whoever was drafting those definitions well knew that by defining what was a DFC establishment and a licensed DFC establishment, they were effectively defining the extent of the jurisdiction. And that is why we say they were so careful in terms of defining what is a DIFC establishment. And they were using technical terms that are picked up in all of the related and relevant statutes. So then, then to take the view that, well, when it says licensed, authorised, licensed and registered, authorised sort of captures everything. Because frankly, anything that's registered, or any body, any member that's registered to do something is also allowed to do it or permitted to do it, so they're authorised. Anyone that's licensed is also allowed to do it, so, that, so they come with an authorised. You end up with the definition of a license center, just being a list of words, one of which, authorised on that very broad construction, swallows up, subsumes uh, all, of the, all of the other words. But actually, the, the, when you look at the, when it says authorised or registered or licensed, it's got a very clear distinction being made between very different categories. It's not saying, well, they could be you know, allowed or permitted or authorised or entitled. It's not just giving a list of broad words to be construed autonomously without any reference to context. Uh, where it's a matter of jurisdiction, where, where it matters to that extent, where you are seeking to attract into the jurisdiction foreign banks, um, and you would not want to drive them away by potentially subjecting all of their global activities to mandatory exclusive DIFC court jurisdiction. That is why in our submission you take the technical Approach. You take the, the approach, as I say, by reference to context. And I realise I'm repeating myself, so I, yeah, so, yeah. so I should stop. Or otherwise, as you said, the legislative would say, authorise and full stop. You didn't need to mention the other word. You need to add if, if They all included in that meaning. Is that what you're saying? Yes, and, and given that you've got all of the, cl the classifications of accreditation, except for one, recognised, which could have very easily been translated into Arabic, yeah. Muatara. But that, that word isn't there. It, we say it is deliberately excluding recognised members and recognised bodies, recognised persons, because they are subject to a very light touch regulation to, to, to attract those bodies into the DIFC, to create the liquid liquidity of the DIFC markets, to bring them in. You do not want to regulate them in the DIFC, and you do not want to subject them to DIFC court regulation. Now, Melanie Friend makes some very good points about floodgate arguments in his skeleton. But I, I do say that you are entitled to, to look at the consequences and ask whether the framers of the legislation in 2004 can reasonably be taken to have intended those uh, consequences. Uh, and, uh, and, and we say that, uh, that actually uh, the idea that you subject uh, those banks, uh, recognised members, in respect to not just what they're doing in NASDAQ, because obviously what they're doing in NASDAQ is subject to DFC court jurisdiction. Trading uh, pursuant to the exemption in this jurisdiction is subject by, by virtue of the other gateways, B, C, and 5A2. Uh, and we, we, we do make the uh, point that party jurisdiction has very uh, significant consequences. There is no further transaction-based requirement. Um, it's common ground between the parties that once you're inside the party jurisdiction, it doesn't matter if the matter that's brought forward or has anything to do with the DIFC. And that, that in itself is potentially very broad, and that is why it seems unlikely that the framers of the jail would wish to submit recognised members and recognised bodies to that uh, very broad party jurisdiction. Um, we do say that the jurisdiction uh, is uh, mandatory and exclusive. 
There are, of course, means of mitigating that very broad jurisdiction. They are well rehearsed since the case of IGPL and Standard Chartered Bank in 2015. Uh, that is in uh, my authority's bundle behind tab 23. But 23, my lord. I don't think I need to read it, but I will mark for your Lordship's attention um, paragraphs 181, which is the reference to His Excellency Justice Al Madani's decision in Alliance. And if I could invite your Lordships to read through to paragraph 195. So there are, well, well, there, are, there are two, aren't there? There's, there are two points. First of all, in respect of where the potential jurisdictional conflict is with another emirate, you're into Article 99 of the UAE Constitution. Um, and so to that extent, there is a, uh, a mitigating factor there. So the, the, to that extent, the broad party jurisdiction is mitigated because a party that feels it ought not to have been dragged into the DIFC courts can, in theory, go to the UAE courts and can, insofar as there are conflicting judgments, then go to the, to the Supreme Court under Article 99 of the Constitution and also the Federal Law of 1973 establishing the US, the Union's Supreme Court. But with the permission of the with, with permission, competent court? My, well, my Lord, yes. And that's why we say it's not particularly effective as a mitigating... So, uh, a missing factor. You're challenging our jurisdiction, so how we can give you a permission to go to the Supreme Court? <laughs> well, uh, the, uh, the point was also taken in the Alliance case by His, His Excellency Justice uh, Ali that um, it's premature to petition the Union Supreme Court until the two final judgments have been rendered. So there was, in that case, the court declined to order a stay by reference to the Article 99 jurisdiction of the, of the UA Supreme Court because one needed to have a judgment from both to generate a sufficient jurisdictional conflict. So the, the idea that any uh, recognised body is going to take comfort from the fact that even though it's subject to DFC party jurisdiction, that doesn't matter because it can wait for conflicting judgments to arise in the different emirates and then uh, go to the Union Supreme Court and that that offers any uh, significant relief to those uh, international banks and international exchanges in respect of the broad party jurisdiction. The idea that that means that that, that jurisdiction is not in some way exorbitant because it doesn't matter because you have some way out uh, in our submission. Uh, and, in, and indeed, it said in Milan France government that the court not, need not be concerned about judicial overreach because of these clear mechanisms. But when those mechanisms are, firstly, foreign non convenience if the rival jurisdiction is outside the UAE, uh, secondly, Article 99 in the Union Supreme Court, if the rival jurisdiction is another emirate. It's another emirate. Or, thirdly, or, or thirdly, the Joint Judicial Committee, if the rival jurisdiction is onshore Dubai. All of those involve a very significant amount of time and a very significant amount of costs. So they are far from being clear mechanisms to mitigate any exorbitance of DRC court party uh, jurisdiction. I've, I've explained uh, our case in terms of the list uh, um, uh, in our submission uh, that is not uh, a record uh, insofar as that list includes uh, entities such as ADC, Emirates, and Mashra, World Bank, Gold Bank, IMG, UBS. Uh, we submit that it was, was never their intention to be subject to the party jurisdiction, the mandatory exclusive party jurisdiction of the DIFC courts. And by inference, it cannot, it's unlikely to have been the framers of the uh, JL, it's unlikely to be their intention that they should be subjected. The intention appears to have been to attract global banks and exchanges by offering them light-touch regulation 
reducing the regulatory and legal burden uh, with a view to ensuring greater liquidity of the DIC uh, capital markets. Um, in terms of the other unintended consequences, so I've, I've mentioned the fact that this would clearly deter global banks and UAE banks from being recognised in the DIC. Uh, it also carries, would also carry the risk of jurisdictional conflict. Um, and as we've explained in our skeleton, we, we submit that as a matter of public order um, and therefore there is no derogation um, from, the, um, from the principles of the JL. So there is, a, there is a further problem that arises as a matter of public order. Uh, in terms of making that submission good, if you have uh, tab 27 in my authorities bundle, You have a decision of the Dubai Court of Cassation in 2012 in appeal number 389 of 2011. And the pages aren't paginated, but if one turns to the third page of this report, uh, the final paragraph on, the, on that page, the rulings of this court are consistent with Article 104 of the temporary constitution of the UAE. The judicial system for each emirate is separate from that of all other emirates, with the exception to matters which fall within the scope of the federal judicial system. The judiciary of Dubai is independent from the federal judicial system and also independent of other local emirate high judicial systems. The judiciaries of each emirate must respect their respective geographic areas of jurisdiction and must not contravene this principle, neither positively nor negatively, such that a court must not find against jurisdiction when in fact it does have jurisdiction, and a court must not trespass into the jurisdiction of other juris judicial systems. This principle of jurisdiction is considered to be a matter of public order and the courts must apply this principle by either finding for or against jurisdiction when deciding a matter put before it. The jurisdiction referred to herein is not local jurisdiction, as that will be decided as between the different courts or judicial bodies which exist under the same judicial system. Now, I'm, I'm not a UAE lawyer, and I, I understand that to mean that insofar as there's a Dubai statute which makes clear provision in respect of jurisdiction, the allocation of jurisdiction is a matter of public order and different courts in different emirates cannot therefore take a discretion approach in respect of whether or not the court in which they are sitting in the emirate does or doesn't have jurisdiction. Yeah, uh, Mr. Reid, can you sort of uh, wind up your yes, submission, please? Yes. We are taking a bit too long now. Yes. Uh, I've explained that the party jurisdiction is already broad. We know from Tavira Securities that a, uh, even if a party became a licensed DSC subject after the cause of action arose, uh, it would be subject to party jurisdiction. That's Tavira. We can see the way in which party jurisdiction can be used or abused as the basis of necessary and proper party jurisdiction pursuant to the Nest Investments decision. Uh, and uh, as I said in the skeleton, there is already concern, even in this court, in the small claims tribunal, as to the extent of party jurisdiction. And uh, I set out behind tabs 26 of my bundle the Interhow decision, where it was suggested that uh, there still needs to be a sufficient link with the DIFC, even where the DIFC the defendants were, in fact, DIFC companies. So that's why we say the DIFC court is unsuitable and would have been seen by the draftsman as being unsuitable to have uh, mandatory and exclusive. jurisdiction uh, in respect of the entire global activities of any uh, uh, recognized um, member or recognized body. No action has been taken by LAMAG in the Abu Dhabi civil courts. We say that is clearly the course they ought to have taken uh, after their complaint to the central bank and to the public prosecutor was rejected. Um, more importantly, for, from the, the point of the perspective of UAE clients or UAE banks, an order by the DFC court will not give them protection in respect of confidentiality and breach of mandate uh, claims because the court that uh, any court uh, that allows them to do that has to be a court of competent jurisdiction, uh, and uh, whether the UAE and that has to be assessed by the UAE courts. So the UAE courts would have to consider that the DIC. This is the UAE court. Well, my lord, in, in, sorry, I mean Abu Dhabi courts. So, in, if, for example. All of them, UAE court. It, 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 Confidentiality would never be exposed without uh, a judicial uh, reasoning. My lord, yes, but if, for example, claims were, 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 were brought in Abu Dhabi courts, the Abu Dhabi court would have to assess whether an order by judicial authority, the DIFC court, 
was sufficient to protect FAB, for example, from liability under the relevant um, UAE statutes in respect of bank and confidentiality and the requirement. Let me take the email. Yes, my lord. Uh, and uh, I, at, uh, I'll just give you the page reference where we deal with that in, in our submissions more fully. That's uh, bundle A, uh, the appeal bundle, tab 20, page 142, where we explore the issues of banking confidentiality and the banking mandate. So, to conclude, we say that the technical uh, terms used in the uh, regulatory and statutory framework are being tracked by the draftsman, clearly in the JAL, and we say that is consistent with the legislative intention that there should be recognised members should be subjected to lighter regulation and to a circumscribed uh, jurisdiction, and, and indeed to no party jurisdiction of the DIFC courts. We say the judge was wrong in taking a broad construction of authorization and he fell uh, into error and we say that that is why the appeal should be allowed. That's it? That's it? Is there it? Thank you. Yes. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Black, uh, how long do you think you'll take? Can you make it brief? Because uh, I'm sorry, I'm looking, I'm looking that way, and I should be looking that way. I, I, I of course. Um, I, I, will, I will make it as brief as I can. Um, you can, I, please. I had, yeah, I had um, certainly uh, uh, budgeted myself on around an hour, uh, and given that my learned friend has said a great deal and taken three hours, uh, it's perhaps not unfair that I could give him an hour uh, to okay. make my submission. Okay. Um, and I'm, I'm going to begin, in fact, where my learned friend left off. Uh, and, and can I please invite uh, the court to take up the appeal bundle and turn uh, to tab six in the appeal bundle, uh, which is the order of the 18th of, of uh, July of the learned judge, uh, Justice Sir Richard Field, because I just want to put matters in context, as my learned friend did, but to deal with the point that he finished on, if I may. So, behind tab six, if you would be kind enough, please, uh, Your Excellency and my Lord, uh, to uh, turn to uh, what's called page 45, you'll see of the appeal bundle, page uh, at the bottom, uh, and just at paragraph 12, we see that uh, the learner judge found that uh, my client had made a good arguable case that it was induced through a dishonest fraud practiced by Mr. Al Jabri and Elite to transfer the bonds to an account in the name of Elite with the second respondent, FAB Securities, which he called the uh, Elite account. Uh, if you then please be kind enough to turn forward to the next page, page 46, uh, and paragraph 15. Uh, in the middle of that paragraph, he found that in my judgment, Lamach has a good arguable case that the bonds are effectively stolen property and remain in the ownership of Lamach. And then passing down to the next paragraph, uh, he finds that Lamag has, in my opinion, a good arguable claims in DIFC law in unjust enrichment, the tort of deceit, fraud, and constructive trust. And as to the latter cause of action, Lamag is entitled to pray and aid, uh, as Lord Brown Wilkinson said in the West Deutsche case, that the court can impose a constructive trust on a defendant who knowingly retains property to which the plaintiff has unjustly been deprived. This dictum is also applicable against the respondents, uh, that's the bank, to the effect that they are obliged to restore the bonds to Lamag, their true owner, and must not act on any instructions from Mr. Al Jabri and or Elite to transfer or deal with the bonds. Turning to the law of the UAE, I accept Lamag's contention. It has a good arguable case against Al Jabri and Elite. Uh, from just enrichment, etc. And then 18, Lama also has a good arguable case in UAE law against the respondents as to as the custodian of the bonds. 
Now, none of this is challenged by the appellant. So one might have thought that when a court of the UAE, as uh, His Excellency uh, Justice Ali uh, just said, uh, the state in which a bank is established has found good grounds to believe that that bank uh, has unwittingly been the vehicle of a $70 million fraud that that bank, as a responsible financial institution of that country, might wish to assist in the administration of justice and voluntarily comply with the orders of a court of that country in order to ensure that the fraudsters don't get their hands on the loot until the court has had a proper opportunity to investigate uh, those matters. Astonishingly, that wasn't the reaction of this bank. The first reaction of this bank, as my learner friend finished upon, was to claim banking secrecy. Uh, and he didn't take you to it, but I will, if I may. Uh, in the same bundle, uh, would you please be kind enough to turn back to page 9? And these were the bank's submissions uh, at paragraph 4.4 where uh, they say uh, that the bank has several obligations to its customers in relation to confidentiality and banking secrecy under UAE law. Now, they were forced to accept, if one goes over to the next page, at page 10, uh, that, that there are derogations from uh, banking secrecy in respect of the reporting of legal violations to the UAE Central Bank and the powers of judicial authorities in Article 120. Uh, I did uh, cause Article 120 to be put before the court, but I think it's probably unnecessary. What it says, essentially, is it's an exception to banking secrecy where there is an order of a judicial authority. This is a judicial authority, uh, but... The bank does not wish to disclose anything about these fraudsters. And so it argues that this judicial authority has no power over it. And that's the context of all of this argument about regulation, the meaning of the provisions uh, of, the, um, uh, uh, of the regulatory law. What this bank is trying to avoid is the argument that this court has the power to make it disclose what became of my client's stolen property. That's what we're dealing with today. We're not dealing with some theoretical argument uh, about the meaning of the statute. The reality is they do not wish to disclose what became of my client's stolen property. Uh, and so they enter into a convoluted analysis, which I will demonstrate is completely untenable, uh, to try and escape the, uh, the jurisdiction of this court, so that they can argue this court has no power whatsoever uh, over it. Uh, and uh, this is a surprising proposition from uh, a bank where the following is not in dispute. It is, and it comes from its own evidence, it is not in dispute uh, that the second appellant is uh, uh, one of only four market makers on the DIFC stock exchange, the, 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 the Nasdaq Dubai, for DP World. It is not in dispute that its predecessor, as my learned friend said, the uh, MBAD, was a market maker also for equity futures. It is not in dispute that the first defendant has acted as a custodian uh, of shares uh, under the DIFC uh, stock exchange that was previously held by Euroclear. It is not in dispute that the first appellant has acted as co-manager in respect of the following offerings on the Nasdaq Dubai, a $1 billion uh, euro, a bond issue by Emirates NBD, and a $1.5 billion sukkah uh, issued by Islamic Development Bank. 
and they are also authorised to carry out even more extensive activities, including launching financial promotions from the DIFC, which I will show you in the judgment in due course. Authorised or recognised, Mr. Black? I'm so sorry. Authorised or recognised? Uh, I say there's no difference, and I'm going to come to that. Um, they, they are recognised members, but they are authorised to do all of that. That's what I say. Uh, and um, I will have to engage upon um, some of the uh, rather tortuous logic that my learned friend uh, has deployed to uh, analyse the JAL, but I can show you that it is completely misconceived. And there is, there is one point, and I, I'm rather excited about it, because it came to me while my learned friend was on his feet, which is totally fake to his case. Uh, and uh, I'm going to come to that. But um, what I say is not surprising, given that background, is that in a carefully reasoned and cogent ruling uh, from uh, Justice Sir Richard Field, who is a banking expert and has practiced in banking law all of his career, both at the bar uh, and uh, on the bench. And it's not surprising that he found the court did indeed have jurisdiction over the appellants. We say that the sole focus of the appellant's appeal is an unrealistic, artificial, and unnatural reading of the judicial authority law, and we say it's ultimately a futile attempt to argue that the appellants don't fall uh, within its ambit. They also try to rerun the floodgates arguments uh, that were rejected by this court in Corinth and almost every single case since. I said I've got to engage somewhat uh, on um, the construction exercise that my learned friend uh, undertook. So I wonder, please, if uh, I could respectfully invite the court uh, to turn in my authorities bundle to the wording of the judicial authorities law uh, itself. Uh, I know we've looked at it, uh, and uh, you will find it uh, behind tab four, uh, in the respondent's authorities bundle, uh, and we can go right to the second page, which is the definitions section. Uh, and uh, I would like to just look at, at the precise definitions of DIFC establishment and licensed DIFC establishment. And it's important that we look at both. So a DIFC uh, establishment it is any entity or enterprise established, licensed, registered, or, or authorized to carry on business or conduct any activity within the DIFC pursuant to DIFC laws. And that includes also a licensed DIFC establishment. A licensed DIFC establishment is any entity or enterprise licensed, registered, or authorized by the Dubai Financial Services Authority to provide financial services, or conduct any other activities in accordance with DIFC laws. So, a DIFC establishment is licensed, registered, or authorised, but not necessarily by the DFSA. And its activities are within the DIFC. A licensed DIFC establishment is licensed, registered, or authorised by the DFSA, but its activities can be carried out anywhere. It doesn't have to have a physical presence in the DIFC, and that's the difference between the two definitions. It's also notable, uh, and this came out, I think, from a learner friend's submission, that the DFSA recognises a licence from another authority for a recognised member. So a recognised member doesn't need a DFSA licence, but it does need a licence recognised by the DFSA as being equivalent to a DFSA licence. So, for example, you, one could say that the DFSA is effectively adopting the licence of the, uh, the regulator of a, reg a recognised member in order to authorise it or permit it to carry on business from the DIFC. 
But I said there was one point that Kurt Rebond is known forever as on his feet, that I thought was absolutely fatal to his fundamental argument. His fundamental argument is this, that the words licensed, registered, or authorized must track the words in the regulatory law. And so they must be, they must be using the technical terms of, uh, that we find in, in the regulatory law. But the regulatory law only relates to entities that are regulated by the DFSA. And if we look at this definition, and this is a pure construction point, the words licensed, registered, or authorized also are used in this statute in relation to DIFC establishments that are not licensed by the DFSA. So it is absurd to suggest that you have jurisdiction over an entity which is not registered or licensed by the DFSA by reference to the definitions of licensing, registration, and authorization by the DFSA. The words must mean the same in both definitions, and they cannot possibly, on any logical view, refer to the regulatory law in relation simply to the IFC establishments because they are not regulated by the regulatory law, because they are, don't fall within the definition of licensed DIFC establishment. That is absolutely fatal to my learned friend's pure technical construction argument. And what it means is the words are used in their normal, natural sense. Another point is this, that if the draftsman here had intended those words to cross-refer to the regulatory law and the definitions, he would have said so. And he would have said that they were, uh, that, that there was a reference to licensing, registration, and authorization as defined in the regulatory law. But there's no such reference. And there couldn't be, of course. And the, regulatory, the regulatory law is a DIFC law, Mr. Black. Exactly. That can be included, anyway. Exactly. That, exactly the point. These words are being used in their natural, ordinary context. Uh, and uh, unlike my little friend, well, I don't know. I'm saying, my, my question is that why the that very last sentence of the last DFC establishment when the legislator said, other activities in accordance with the IFC laws, the legislature has meant that in accordance with the reg regulatory law as well. Well, yes, it includes, of course, a license. A, a, a license, the IFC attachment, includes that. But there's no reason for excluding that. It, it doesn't say exclusively. Uh, and if you're going to indulge in the pure technical exercise that a lot of friends have done, then the words establish, license, and register must mean the same in both definitions. You can't have, you can't have the phrases meaning different things in, 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 different, uh, in different parts of the same statute. That would be a nonsense. Well, if the regulatory law have given you a different functions and different uh, a definition for each of this, if the regular, regulatory law comes and says, this yes. is what's meant by license, yes. this is what meant by authorized, this is what meant by uh, recognized, and that is, again, it's identically it's DIFC law, and something must be followed in terms to interpret what the legislature has meant by this article. The, but, but, yes, uh, I, absolutely, it, that, it's included, but that doesn't mean it's exclusive definition. Uh, so, so, yes, of course, uh, if somebody is licensed by the DFSA, it's included in this definition. Uh, there's, there's no question about that, but my learned friend's point is different. My learned friend's point is that though that phrase, licensed, registered, or authorized, only means licensed, registered, or authorized, as defined in the regulatory law. And that's his error. And that's the error that doesn't stand up to the scrutiny when you see the same phrase used in an entity which isn't regulated. So it means they are, it means established, licensed, registered, or authorized in some other way. And that 
can only support the construction of those words in this statute as having a general rather than a specific meaning, specifically cross-referring, and only, his, his point is, and you have to find that they only refer to the regulatory law, which is a nonsense. And they they are, why it's nonsense? Regulatory. Because they are mentioning entities that perform under the DFSA. Yes. And what I, I think, what Mr. Reed trying to argue, it has some degree of logic. Because if you want to know what kind of businesses the DFSA regulates, then you have to go to the DFSA's regulation and see what they meant by. Yes. No, I, uh, with respect, you're, you're, of, of course. I, I, well, you I, seem I, sometimes to, to agree with Mr. Reed, and sometimes you just make. I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't no, 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 Your, Your Excellency. What he is saying is that, that is the exclusive definition. And why the definition cannot be exclusive and precise as, as, as far as Mr. Reed wants to take it, because we are in a professional jurisdiction, yes, a, a very sophisticated uh, business regime, a very uh, advanced regulatory framework. Yes. Why should why we shouldn't we should be uh, very specific? Yes. To the degree that Mr. Reed wants to take us to. Yes. Because. Because the, what he is saying there is that there is a, a cross-reference to the definitions in the regulatory law. But if one runs through, if one runs through the analysis, first of all, you've got to, you have to define those words in that statute to mean that and nothing else. And that cannot, with respect, be right. Because the point I'm making at the moment, and I'll develop the other points in answer, but the point I'm making at the moment is that it can't be right if the, same, if the same phrase is referred to matters that can, is referred to entities that cannot possibly be, be regulated by the DFSA. We're just, I'm just at the moment focusing upon his argument that there is a very specific meaning to that phrase. I do agree that entities that are regulated, licensed, authorized by the DFSA clearly fall within that definition. But what I say is it can't be an exclusive definition when you're looking at the wording of the statute. And at the end of the day, we are trying to uh, interpret the meaning of this statute. Uh, now, the, the learned judge, uh, and I'll come to the way he did it, because basically I say that what he did is perfectly correct. Uh, and uh, it's a very wise judgment, actually, because it doesn't take the court to areas that it doesn't have to go to. And I'll develop that um, in, in a moment. It, it, in fact, let me take you immediately to the ruling and why I say it's right uh, and uh, why I say it's a wise ruling, too. Uh, you will find that uh, in the uh, appeal Uh, you'll find that in the appeal. Uh, you'll find that in the appeal bundle. Uh, if you turn, it's tab four B, and I'd like to go uh, to paragraph twenty, uh, if I may. Paragraph twenty one. I'm sorry, which is on page twenty. Yes. Paragraph twenty, uh, which is on page thirty seven G. Right. And this is where the learned judge analysed uh, indeed what the these particular uh, entities were entitled to do. And my learned friend rather skated over this. And this is another point that I say is a fatal point to his case. Let's just see what uh, the judge correctly found. Uh, the respondents were licensed to do. So since the respondents are licensed and supervised by a financial service regulator in the UAE, they are permitted uh, under REC uh, Rule 22.5.3.8 20, to offer services directly to DIFC customers without being restricted to dealing with such customers pursuant to unsolicited requests for execution-only services. Uh, as provided in REC Rule 2.5.1G. They are therefore permitted 
to provide the following financial services as defined in the DFSA rulebook, uh, general module. One, trading securities on their own behalf. Two, trading securities on behalf of customers. Three, trading securities as a market maker. Four, providing custody of securities. In addition, pursuant to 3.41a of the DFSA rulebook general module, by reason of being recognized members licensed supervised by the UAE regulator, they're able to make a financial promotion in and from the DIFC, notwithstanding the general prohib prohibition against that activity in Article 41A of the Regulatory Law 2004. Now, the reason I say this is fatal for my learned friend's case, and he skated over it, that last sentence, as a matter of regulatory approval, these entities, because they are UAE regulated entities, and the judge confined, and this is the reason why the judge confined himself to, in his judgment, to dealing with UAE entities only, they are entitled to provide financial services in and from the DIFC, unlike Goldman Sachs, unless Goldman Sachs is an entity here, in fact, it does. But, uh, but they, in their own right, are entitled to provide financial promotions from, in and from uh, the DIFC. And, and Mr. Black, you're saying you and the judge are allowed to say, as long as they provide their services from the DIFC, yes. they can fall under any of these categories, license, register, or authorized. They are authorized. When, and Mr. Mr. Reid, problem is that, he says, I do not accept when the judge Describe me, the respondent are licensed. He said, I'm not licensed, I'm just recognized, and that's a completely different category. So, even the, even the sentences you're referring to from the judgment, Mr. Reed said, I'm initially have a problem with it. I'm not licensed, I've not been licensed, I don't carry any license. Yes. He said, I'm not licensed, and that one of his problem with the judgment, he said, I'm not licensed, I've never been licensed. But they are entitled. What they're entitled for them is that it's like the question of permitted, like what Chief Justice said. to say. Are they permitted to do that? They are permitted to do this. They are allowed, permitted, authorized. That's the case. That's what the judge said. That's what I said. In and from the DIFC, other people have to get a license to do it, but because they are licensed by the UAE regulator, they are allowed to do it, they are permitted to do but it. That's they are mean. Authorized. That's mean. The regulatory authority didn't know what they do. They can provide this as a license. They can tell that you come do your business. They can ask the third party come and uh, we, we, we register you, do whatever you want. But license, the licensed companies have certain things to do. Registered company has certain things to do. Recognized companies has a completely another thing to do. And Mr. Reed has taken us through. A different kind of services that the DFSA, I mean, I would say, is ask different companies to do. Each business come under a certain category. That categorization are carefully named because carefully named based on financial and legal definition. Now the, impo the, the importance of the point that I'm making, Your Excellency, is this, that Let's talk about financial license to do financial promotion. This, these, because they are UAE regulated, they are entitled to do things that other people can only do if they are licensed to do it. So you can only act in and you can only provide a financial service in and from the DISC in breach of the financial prohibition if you are licensed to do so. I think this is not right, Mr. Black. I thought the general idea is no one can do any business within the DFC without certain permission. Yes. Permission can be license, can be recognition, can be authorization, can be something. Yes, but if you UAE or any UAE, the main idea is no one will do anything within the DFC without falling under certain category. Yes, I think that's it, and that's the point I'm making. But you know, you, you just said because they are UAE, you said because they are UAE entities, they are allowed to carry on business from the DFC. Yes. Uh, without permission of the DFC? 
Are you no, 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 forgive me. Let me take it more slowly. Uh, yeah. Forgive me. Yeah, I, 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 I think I haven't made myself clear. And maybe you did. <laughs> <laughs> the, this, these banks are entitled, because they are UAE regulated, to carry on financial services in and from the DIFC that other people who are not in their position would have to have a license for. So, they are permitted, we say, authorized to give, to carry on those financial services and it is, it is, uh, it, it would be inconsistent we say that if you didn't, if, 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 if you say, oh, they're unauthorized to carry on these services, and that's what they argue, they are unauthorized to carry on these services, but in some other way, uh, they, are, uh, they, are, they, have, they have some status that, that, uh, that, that uh, allows them to. Let, let me develop the submission, if you will, uh, and, and I'll show you where it goes. Uh, can I take you to... Uh, Paragraph 37, uh, paragraph 22 are, are on the next page, 37. Uh, that's just, uh, that, just to record, though that's where you find in the judgment the actual, uh, the actual activities they've undertaken in the uh, DIFC. I mentioned it before, so I won't go over it again. But to develop the argument, it's the appellant's case that they are able to carry out, and indeed have carried out, all these activities without being licensed, registered, or authorized by the DFAs to do so. So on what basis do they say they were legally able to do those things? Now that's not really something that my learned friend addresses, quite, quite frankly. On his argument, that, they are, that these activities are unlicensed, unregistered, and unauthorized. That's the point that I, I think Your Excellency was making before. That nobody can provide financial services in and from the DIFC unless they are authorized to do so by the DFSA. So, or licensed to do so. Or licensed to do so. But the appellant's case appears to be they are allowed or permitted to do so by the DFSA, but they are not authorized. They try to make this artificial distinction between being allowed and permitted and being authorized. We say that is a nonsensical distinction, which rightly found no favor whatsoever with Justice Sir Richard Field. And can I take you to his ruling at paragraphs 36 to 39? Uh, which you will find at page 37 at L. In the bundle boy. I do have one, yes. And he says this. Uh, so he actually declined to accept both parties' uh, approaches to how one looks at, at um, uh, Article 5A1A of the Judicial Authority Law. Uh, and uh, he held, uh, at beginning at the bottom of the page of 37L, I take the view, having regard to legislative intent underlying Article uh, 5A1A, which I hold to be to render those entities which are officially permitted by the DIFC regulatory authority to provide financial services to customers or otherwise carry on business or conduct any activity in DIFC susceptible to the jurisdiction of the DIFC courts. Accordingly, I propose to abstain from construing the definitions in Articles 2 uh, 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 and the wording of Article 5A1A by taking a literalist approach to the background regulatory regime. And instead, I look at the substance of the component parts of the regime, all the time keeping in mind the purpose and intent of Article 581A. Adopting this approach, 
I conclude that by virtue of the DFSA entering the names of the respondents in the list of recognized members, thereby entitling them to trade on NASDAQ Dubai's members of the exchange, free from the limitation contained in 251G, each of the respondents is authorized and or registered by the DFSA to provide financial services in accordance with DIFC law and is therefore a DIFC licensed uh, establishment. Uh, and then there's a passage where he deals with the question in, in accordance with the law. Now, with respect to the learned judge, we agree with what he said. We submit to this court the ruling exhibits simple, down-to-earth, common good sense. And that the below judge have brought two, two more definitions, which one of them entitled, which will never exist in the jail, and another one permit, permission. So we use two extra words to the registration, licensing, and things like entitling and permitting. No, what, what he is... That's very generalization, isn't it? No, what, what he is saying is you look at the intent uh, of uh, what it, this law it is um, directed to achieve. And what he finds to be the intent, which we say is just simple good sense, is that if somebody is authorized, permitted, licensed, allowed to provide financial services in and from the DIFC, they should be under the jurisdiction of the DIFC courts. And he said that is the clear legislative intent behind the judicial authority law, and we say he was absolutely right to do so. Uh, and the, uh, you have to get into the most extraordinary convolutions uh, to try and wiggle out of that uh, simple, uh, and we say common sense, uh, approach. But can I look at the foundations of what my learned friends uh, are, are arguing, as did uh, the, uh, the, the learned judge? Because this is an appeal on a narrow point uh, of, uh, const uh, of construction and of jurisdiction. Uh, and uh, in the interest of procedural efficiency, the judge ordered that paragraphs 3.1 to 3.75, as my learned friend said, uh, of my learned friend's um, submissions of 8th August would stand as the uh, appeal notice. Now I'm going to come back to uh, those paragraphs at the end of my, my submission. But can I just deal with what they submit now and what they submit in their, in their skeleton? And frankly, we say that the appellants misrepresent the judge's approach to the construction of the judicial authority law at paragraph 6.3 of their skeleton. This is the point you were making a moment ago uh, about uh, it allegedly being broad. Um, so could I just take you to their skeleton? Uh, you'll find on page 18, paragraph 6.3. And uh, here they submit to the court. The judge seemed further to derive from that passage. That's a passage in Faraki that we, we looked at before. The judge seemed further derived from that passage. In the absence of evidence as to the meaning of the underlying Arabic, the court should always, they emphasize the word, always prefer a broader construction of any English word on the assumed basis of the meaning of the Arabic, which may not lend itself to a precise facility of expression and legal phraseology, is generally broader and more fluid in its meaning. He said nothing of the sort uh, in his judgment, uh, and we see that from paragraph 31. This is a complete misrepresentation of what he said. Uh, if you look at paragraph 31, could you turn back, please, one page? Yes. Uh, in the bundle to page 37K. Uh, he there cited uh, from the decision of this court, uh, of course, that I see that uh, uh, my Excellency uh, was a party to that decision uh, too. Uh, and 
it is the guidance of this court that he followed. So, uh, what this court was saying is that you bear in mind that the ultimate and dominant text is the Arabic, and the court's using translation. Uh, it must be remembered that Arabic may not lend itself to a, as precise facility of expression of legal phraseology as English. The translation may result in what appears to be a very precise expression in English, uh, which too narrowly defines the meaning of the original Arabic text. That is why it is important, when construing DIFC legislation such as Law 16, not to be lit not to, by a literalist construction of the English to lose sight of the legislative purpose underlying the text. So the learned judge was not saying you've always got to uh, adopt a broad approach. What he was saying is, because it's an English translation of an Arabic text, when you're dealing in English and giving a judgment, you've got to, you've got to go to the heart of the matter. You've got to look at what is the mischief uh, that the uh, act or, or law uh, is, um, uh, is addressed to? And that's exactly what he did. He did not then say, I'm going to take apart, I'm going to pass the English translation. What he said was, I'm going to follow what I'm told to do by the Court of Appeal. And I'm going to, I'm going to look at what I have found to be the legislative intent of this jurisdictional uh, statute. So he went on to say that he was not qualified to uh, judge on the rival contentions as to the meanings to be attributable to the original Arabic. Of course, this court has the advantage uh, of being able to judge between the rival contentions uh, of, 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 of the... Um, with two Arabic judges on, Emirati judges on the panel. <laughs> exactly. There's no yeah, better exactly. panel than this. There's no better panel exactly. than this. <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly so. Exactly so. But the judge didn't do that below. Uh, and he, 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 because he couldn't. Uh, as indeed I can't. Uh, and and uh, he followed the directions that he was given by this court to focus upon what he believed to be the legislative intent, uh, rather than the literal words of the English translation. Uh, and, and so he did not go into error at all. Uh, he did precisely what uh, he was bound to do by the decision of this court. And if you then please turn on to paragraph uh, 36 uh, of uh, the, 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 um, the ruling, um, uh, can I just read from a part uh, that uh, I didn't take you to before, just beginning with paragraph 36. He said, in my judgment, when construing the definitions in Article 2 and 5A1A, the court should have regard to the background financial service regulation regime as it exists at the time of the construction exercise is being undertaken and should not conduct a process of comparison between former and current regulatory background. So he accepted that the regulatory background was certainly the context, the factual matrix, the, the legislative matrix in which he had to interpret uh, the statute. But uh, he uh, rejected the appellant's contention that the Article 2 definitions are to be construed strictly in the light of the narrow technical meaning to be given to the words in, that is to be found in the background regulatory regime. And I pointed before to the fact that as a matter of strict construction, it would be absurd to apply those meanings to, some, to, to an entity that is not regulated uh, by uh, the DFSA, and yet on the Learner Friends construction, you would have to do that for there to be consistency in, in the judicial or authorities' law. And if the draftsman had intended that the words in the judicial authority law should reflect those narrow technical meanings, he could and indeed would have said so. But he didn't. They are not the use of the capitalised terms, the terms of art that one sees in the regulatory law. When you look at regulatory law, you see that they are in capitals and they go to the definitions. There could have been a cross-reference. There wasn't. 
it's clear that the words were being used in a, a, a more general sense. And we respectfully agree with the learned judge's approach and submit, as I said before, that it is a very wise judgment because otherwise the court would have to give a de definitive and theoretical ruling on the meanings of, the, of, of uh, those terms in the regulatory law, the markets law, and the DFSA rules. And we say that the court shouldn't be drawn down that dangerous path, particularly when a lot of my learned friends at least written submissions, because he rather avoided them in his oral submissions, are just simply wrong. And can I, can I point to that? Um, so if you'd be kind enough to take up his skeleton uh, and turn to uh, page 11. You have a skeleton, Mr. Black? You know? I'm sorry, uh, no, my learned friend's skeleton. What I'm saying is that uh, it, it's a very dangerous route to, to follow what my learned friend says uh, in his written submissions and his yeah. uh, Mid oral submissions. If you go, for example, and I'm just going to give you two or three examples where he's just actually wrong and it would lead the court into error. Um, so, for example, on page uh, 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 page 11, 11 paragraph 5.4, uh, if you'd be kind enough, he refers at B to ancillary service providers. Um, Actually, there are no such things as ancillary service providers uh, anymore. Article 60 has been abolished. Um, and so that rather puts a hole there. Um, secondly, the skeleton is full of assertions that are simply made without uh, evidence as to what banks do or don't do uh, as a matter of practice. Um, I, for example, uh, 5.12... Uh, Uh, he, uh, he says, without any evidence whatsoever, it's only where a bank uh, requires more extensive rights that he either seeks to exercise it through a separate entity that is authorised and licensed, or in only a small number of cases, the recognised member has itself additionally applied to be licensed as an authorised firm, so that it then directly is regulated by the DFSA. How can he speak? for the intention of foreign banks as to what they, as, as to what they do uh, uh, and make those uh, assertions. And indeed, I, I'm told that the reason certain banks have more than one registration is because... I, I lose the track. What are you reading, Mr. Brown? I'm reading from paragraph 5.12 of my learned friend Skeleton on the bottom of page 14, where he makes assertions as to the intention of other banks uh, and what they do or don't do. Uh, but the court will know that uh, a reason for having more than one registration of, an, uh, of a banking group is because DIFC branches are treated as separate entities for regulatory purposes, uh, as opposed to the head office or other branches. And then if we go to the next paragraph, 5.1.3, uh, he says this on page 15 of this guise. Obtaining recognised member status therefore appears to be viewed in practice as a necessary step in order to make, uh, in order to trade on Nasdaq Dubai or the Dubai Mercantile Exchange as the two AMIs and the IFC. Again, an assertion without any evidence uh, as to what is the practice. Those financial institutions seek that status in order to be able to trade in the single stock futures of a contract or a relatively small number of UAE-listed companies. As of 2016, there were only nine such companies. Of those nine, only DP World remains listed on NASDAQ Dubai. That's just simply demonstrably wrong, because we've seen the evidence of what, in fact, his own client does. His client doesn't just trade uh, in single stock futures. His own client has acted as a manager of a billion dollar uh, bond issue here and a 1.5 billion dollar sukuk issue, not to mention also acting uh, as uh, custodians. So the, the judge, learned judge, was particularly wise, we say, not to go down uh, FAB's line of reasoning, since it gives rise to the absurdity that we adverted to a moment ago, 
the, the, the appellants can, for example, offer services that anybody else would have to be licensed by the DIFSA, DFSA to offer, uh, but uh, they say um, they um, are entitled to uh, give those services without any authority, any permission, or any authorization. Uh, and they, they, they make this wholly artificial definition uh, between authority uh, and uh, permission. Uh, so uh, they are not authorized to offer those services, but they are permitted to offer those services. And so, based on that distinction between authorized and permitted, they escape the, liability, the, the, the liabilities that they owe by reason of being subject to the jurisdiction of this court. This is what, that's what this case boils down to. Really, that semantic distinction between authorization and permission and it, it, within those Arabic words. That's ultimately what their case is, that if you read those words uh, in the original text, uh, they do not include the, de the, the word authorization. Uh, they only mean um, uh, permission. It's a bizarre result, we say, and it can't be right. So the murder judge in his judgment, in, in, in backing up his analysis, of the legislative uh, purpose uh, was very careful to analyze the regulatory regime. Uh, and um, he does that, if you'd be kind enough to go back to uh, the ruling, uh, at paragraphs 14 through to 21, which you will find on pages 37E to G uh, on the, uh, uh, in the bundle. Uh, I, I don't uh, intend to read them uh, to you, but just to show you that he was very careful uh, to understand what the regulatory regime was. Uh, and at 14, he, he sets out what recognition is. At 15, uh, he, he uh, refers to the, uh, uh, the, uh, the module... At 16, uh, he sets out the module, and in particular, he focuses upon, uh, at, at, at the end, 2.5.3, the uh, exemption that these uh, appellants have because they are regulated in the UAE. Uh, and uh, then he, re he refers to uh, paragraph 3.2, again, of the module, and sets out their responsibilities. And uh, he sets there that they are, for example, are, are liable to notify the DFSA if, it, if they have reasonable grounds for suspecting that uh, uh, any order or transaction may constitute market uh, abuse. Uh, and uh, he there also records the DFSA's guidance that uh, it does not consider that a person which meets the requirements to be recognized in the DFSA as a recognized body or recognized member, which carries on the activities in accordance with the rules in the recognition module, would be conducting financial services in and from the DIFC. That is, there's no problem with that. My little friend made a great deal of it. There's no problem with that. Because these parties are entitled, through the exemption, to carry on. Um, services in and from the DIFC. Uh, so, uh, whilst a normal, if you like, whilst the international banks who, who are not regulated in the UAE, uh, that, that, that statement applies to them absolutely. It doesn't actually apply to uh, these defendants, uh, these appellants, because they are entitled by reason of the exemption in 2.5.3 that's set out uh, under paragraph 69. Now the appellants, so then the learned judge ultimately comes to the view, having undertaken all of that analysis, saying that as against that background, these, these appellants are officially permitted, his words, officially permitted by the DIFC regulatory authorities to provide financial services to customers 
in the DISC or otherwise conduct business or any act, or, or activities in the DISC. So that was his finding as to what they were. Uh, and uh, that takes us back to 36 uh, at page 37L. So he was careful to look at what they permitted to do, and he said, how can, in all seriousness, how can people who are officially permitted to carry out those services not be subject to the jurisdiction of the DISC court? Now, the appellants in their skeleton say this is wrong, and they give their, that, that he was wrong to say that, uh, and they give their reasons at section 8, on page 23 uh, of their skeleton. Uh, and can I just take you to that uh, again, uh, if I may? So page 23, uh, section 8. Uh, and uh, we just begin uh, uh, over the, uh, the page of 22. They said the exercise that the judge undertook. Then at top 23, uh, was a derived relation to attention from the relevant statutes and regulations uh, is the subject of DIFC court jurisdictions to entities that are broadly permitted by the DFSA to provide financial assistance <coughs> and authorised and registered as used in the relevant statutory definitions may therefore be construed by reference to such a legislative intention to mean broadly uh, permitted. Now in fact of course he said no such thing. The words broadly permitted, which are put in quotations there, form no part of his judgment. He never used those words, and yet they seem to be saying that he did. We've just shown you the words he used. He used the words officially permitted by the DISC regulatory authorities. He was very careful to look at what they were authorised to do. And he summarised that against the background as officially permitted to provide financial services to customers in the DIFC and carry on business and conduct activities in the DIFC. And my learned friend tried to say that you must construe the judicial authority law by reference to the terms of the regulatory law. But the legislative purpose that we're looking at is nothing to do with the regulatory law. The, the purpose that we're looking at is jurisdiction. And so one is interpreting a jurisdictional statute against the general background of activities that parties are permitted, authorised to carry out in the DISC, and you look at the purpose, the legislative purpose of the, of, the, of, the, of the jurisdiction statute, not of the regulatory statute. It is in our submission, an extraordinary submission, that you should be asked to interpret jurisdiction by reference to those uh, regulatory uh, well, in provisions. My, in my opinion, this is a bit bizarre because you want me to interpret what's Categories of business that DFSA license authorized and without without allowing me to look at the regulatory framework, which which is defined, which is <laughs> license authorized. You want me to interpret the judge dealing with a DFSA regulated or licensed or authorized or permitted or entitled, without even giving me as a judge or asking me to look at the, the regulatory law. No, no, with respect, uh, with, I'm, not, uh, I'm not asking you not to look at the regular... Uh, you just did. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. <laughs> with respect, I didn't, and nor did the judge. The judge... Uh, I, 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 if you'd like me to go back over what I've just spent the last 20 minutes with, the, the judge looked at it, and he said, yes, this is what they're entitled to do. And the judge looks at that uh, and says and says this is what they are officially permitted to do. And what he said is, it cannot be outside of the legislative intention of 
a, a, an, of a jurisdiction statute, the people who are officially permitted, when I look at the regulations, to do all of these things in the DIFC, it's an absurd result to suggest that they are not susceptible to the jurisdiction of the DIFC court. So he's done exactly what you want to do. Uh, and I'm suggesting that you do exactly what you want to do. I'm not suggesting for one second that you disregard the regulations. On the contrary, the judge was careful, as we've just seen, in his judgment to set it out. And I am suggesting he was right to do that. You look at what somebody is officially committed to do. And that's what he did do. And I say to my dear friends, convolutions and wriggling to try and narrow the words down so that he gets out from underneath them uh, is no more than a cynical attempt to escape from the jurisdiction of this court to make it give information to it about a fraud that my client has, has been the victim of worth $70 million. That's what, that's what this is all about. Um, and uh, so my little friend is suggesting that uh, the words authorised and registered uh, mean broadly permitted. But I say that this court shouldn't fall for that submission because it's not right. That's not what the judge was saying. He didn't use those words. He said no such thing. He looked at the precise terms in which they were permitted to carry on business. And he said that they must necessarily, as a matter of legislative intent, fall within the jurisdiction uh, of this court. And he very properly looked at the substance and not the disputed translation uh, of uh, the Arabic words. And if you go to paragraph 38 uh, of his judgment, uh, which you find uh, at page 37M, uh, uh, he says, I conclude by virtue of the DSA entering the names of respondents in its list of re recognized members, thereby entitling them to trade on the NASDAQ Dubai as members of an exchange with the DIFC customers free from limitation uh, contained uh, in 2.5 and 1G. Each of the respondents is authorized and or registered by the DFSA to provide financial services in accordance with DIFC laws and is therefore a DIFC license establishment. So he's done exactly what you want to do, uh, Your Excellency. He's looked precisely at what they are authorized to do by the DFSA and he says, and, and, and precisely how they are recorded as being entitled uh, to do those things. And he has found that it falls within the definition uh, uh, of uh, under Article 5 uh, of the DFS, uh, of the Judicial Authorities Law. And indeed, it's, it's hard to understand in our uh, submission how on any normal or sensible meaning of the words, placing an entity on a list of those entitled to trade on NASDAQ Dubai and entitled to make financial promotions in and from the DIFC is not registering or authorizing uh, that entity to carry out those financial services. Well, their friend talks about light regulation, but they are still regulated, whether it's light or heavy-handed. And so at paragraph 40 of the ruling, the judge explained the points further. And uh, just halfway down paragraph 40, he says this. First, by reference, by reason of their status as recognized members, the respondents are entitled to undertake financial services by making use of DIFC regulated uh, AMIs in order to trade with DIFC customers. And it is through, and it is enough for the purpose of the definition of licensed DIFC establishment. Second, to the extent it might be relevant whether the respondents are conducting financial services in and from the DISC, this is a question to be decided by the court. And I take the view that the exercise of the entitlement to trade on NASDAQ Dubai with DISC customers, free of the restrictions in Rule 
uh, Rep 2.5.1 plainly constitutes the conduct of financial services in and from the DIFC. So he's made findings which, in my respectful submission, are sensible, straightforward, and totally in accordance with the regulatory background and the legislative intent of the Judicial Authorities Law. We do maintain, and your excellencies are the best judges of that, uh, that the Arabic supports uh, our, um, uh, our analysis and that authorised may be uh, read as permitted uh, and that registered may be uh, read as entered on an official list. However, we recognise that the learned judge didn't base his judgments on that. We've not cross-appealed uh, on, on that point. Um, and he said that it was unnecessary to have recourse to the competing translations. Um, but of course, you will look at, you will obviously look at the wording in Arabic uh, yourselves. Um, my learned friend recognizes that the floodgates argument um, has really got short shrift uh, in, um, in other cases and uh, uh, very properly did not press it. Uh, with, with any enthusiasm before you uh, a, a while ago. And indeed, the learned judge was mindful uh, of uh, those arguments when at paragraph 35 on page 37L uh, of the ruling, uh, he uh, referred to uh, the, uh, the, the uh, ability of the court to utilize the doctrine of forum non convenience where the alternative jurisdiction exists outside the UAE and the power of the Union Supreme Court where there is a jurisdiction competition uh, between the uh, uh, between uh, courts within uh, the UAE. So he was mindful uh, of those points. Well, then a friend tries to get round them uh, by saying, uh, well, the, the jurisdiction is mandatory and exclusive. Uh, the, the jurisprudence of this court, as he recognised, has always been that the exclusivity under uh, this law is limited to uh, the confines of the Emirate of, of Dubai. It, it would be uh, moving away from the established uh, findings of, of um, the, uh, uh, the, the DIFC judges, which never have been questioned before today. Uh, uh, and, and so the floodgates argument really falls away. So I said I'd finish my submissions, and I'm just about, I think, an hour, um, uh, with reference to uh, the actual grounds of appeal uh, that my friends have put forward. And you'll find them in this bundle, uh, behind tab two, uh, at, at page seven. Uh, and... Uh, these are the provisions that the learned judge directed would be the, the grounds of appeal. Uh, and I'd like to direct you to uh, paragraph 3.7, uh, if I may, and just go through the grounds that uh, my, my learned friend um, uh, submitted here. Have you back, Chief Justice? Yeah, Mr. Ba uh, Mr. Black, I miss you the, the last the last few minutes. I think just two minutes. What were yes, you speaking? Uh, what we speaking about? What we saying when yes. the last couple of minutes? I will I will take you to it because this is the, the this is this uh, by law is the very final section uh, of my submission. I was going to look at the grounds of appeal uh, that uh, you will find in the appeal bundle at page 7. So we are behind tab 2 at page 7, and these are what the learned judge ordered were to stand as the grounds of, of appeal. And I'm just going to go through those in the last couple of minutes uh, of my submission. It's a shame we lost <laughs> the connection just as I was really Yeah, you were, about, you, were about, uh, you were about saying this is my last part, and then you were cut off. <laughs> Yes, this is this is the last part, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yes. and uh, we're just going to go through the grounds of appeal. Uh, and so, if you'd be kind enough to look at three point seven, uh, then then there are subparagraphs, and these are what they say uh, are their grounds of appeal. So, three point seven one, 
They say it's a question of construction. Uh, and so uh, they, they say, because they were looking for permission to appeal there, they say that uh, their construction, uh, it, it, they say, is, is arguable. Uh, and uh, we have, of course, submitted that uh, the word authorised in particular uh, does, uh, or rather we have submitted that their uh, construction, that the word authorised does not include permitted and that included on an official, and, and, and that um, registered uh, does not uh, comprehend included on an official list is untenable. Uh, we say uh, that uh, their uh, construction is unrealistic, and indeed, as, as we say, uh, you can't have the words that uh, they construe applying to uh, entities that are not regulated by the DFSA, uh, which you see uh, when you look at, at, at uh, Article 2 of the JAL. So to give a, a very simple example, um, if they are right, and the words, uh, uh, the words licensed, uh, uh, regular, uh, licensed, registered, or authorised only mean licensed, registered or authorised under the regulatory law in accordance with the categories under the regulatory law. What happens to a law firm, for example? Um, a law firm would then um, have to uh, fall within those categories. Registered. So, uh, well, let's take a restaurant now, uh, which was, I think, the example that he gave. Uh, we have restaurants as, as my... Uh, uh, as, as my Lord, uh, His Excellency uh, Justice Ali said, they have to be licensed, but they're not licensed or regulated under the um, regulatory law. How do they fall under the definition of DIOC establishment if it has to be under the, the regulatory law, if the words are not used in a more general sense? Well, you just said licensed. Sorry? You just said licensed. Yes, I know. But what he's saying is license only means licensed under the regulatory law. That's what he's saying. Uh, and that cannot be right. Uh, when you apply that definition uh, to the, the broader type of, of DIFC establishment. Anyway, I repeat myself, those, those have been the submissions. At paragraph 3.7.2, uh, he said that the judge's finding creates a conflict of jurisdiction with the Abu Dhabi courts. No such conflict has ever been explained. And it's not explained in the skeleton. Where is this conflict? All that's said in the skeleton is that if there is a conflict, it might have to be decided by the Union Supreme Court. But of course, that would only arise if there were two competing judgments. But there are no competing judgments in Abu Dhabi, and indeed no competing proceedings. And it's difficult to see how there could be competing proceedings. Uh, when these defendants uh, or, or appellants have no claim against um, Lamech. And then 3.7.3, 3, uh, the judge's interpretation of licensed DIFC establishments involves a significant extension of the party jurisdiction of the DIFC court. Uh, that argument is inconsistent uh, with Corinth, where it was rejected. You don't decide what the policy is and then interpret the law uh, in a, a, accordance uh, with it. Uh, you, if the law is, is, is plain and simple in accordance with its terms, that's it. Policy is rather different from legislative intent. Uh, and uh, what, uh, what my learner friend is here saying is that uh, it's the floodgates argument all over again, uh, again which has been repeatedly rejected uh, by uh, uh, this court and uh, the court of first instance. And then he says at 3.7.4, the extension of the party jurisdiction resulting from the jurisdictional ruling confers on the DIFC court's exclusive and mandatory jurisdiction in respect of any claim against UAE banks listed as recognised members. Uh, we say that's simply wrong. Uh, and it is the established jurisprudence of, of this court that exclusivity only relates to uh, 
uh, issues of jurisdiction within the Emirate uh, of uh, Dubai. Uh, and indeed, the judge made that perfectly clear at paragraph 35 uh, of his judgment. And then paragraph 3.715, further the extension of the court's mandatory exclusive jurisdiction uh, to uh, onshore UAE financial institutions by reason only of identification as recognized members gives rise to a conflict of constitutional character. Well, that seems to be a, a, a repetition of what was said at 3.7.1, but compounded by the error uh, in the previous ground. And so when one looks at it, the only ground really of any substance uh, is the one encapsulated at paragraph 3.4, just two pages earlier on, uh, on page 6, uh, paragraph 3.4, uh, of uh, his submission uh, and the grounds of appeal. And just uh, four lines up from the bottom. It is submitted that authorised does not mean generally permitted or allowed in a broader sense. And being added to a list does not mean registered. The short answer to those points are these. The judge was right to hold that on any sensible basis authorised is the same in substance as being officially recognised. That's what he said. Uh, officially permitted. Or that they are synonymous. Officially permitted and authorised mean the same thing. Uh, and he did not hold, as they suggest, that there is a general permission or a broad sense of, of being allowed. Um, that was not his finding at all, and that's a mischaracterization. He was careful to look at what was officially, what was officially permitted. Secondly, the judge was also right to hold that being included on an official list of those permitted to carry out otherwise forbidden activities is the same in substance as being registered to carry out those otherwise <coughs> forbidden activities. And so they are being, so that is, they are recognized to be able to perform those activities which would otherwise include a license. And we understand that those points that I've just made are as correct in Arabic as they are in English. Uh, and so, uh, in the circumstances, it is our submission that the judge was perfectly correct in the approach he took. There is no error in his approach. Uh, and what's more, he was right. And so the appeal must fail. Those are our submissions. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear or see me? Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I can. Can you, oh, can you sorry. hear? Sorry. I'm, I'm, <laughs> Uh, I can't see myself on the screen, but am I, are you hearing me? Can you hear me? Yes, I am here. Yes, okay. yes we do. Uh, so, Mr. Reed, you want to reply? Have, is there no, any no. question from the bench? Uh, no, Judge no. Omar, Judge Ali, any more questions for Mr. Mr. Black? No, if there's none, have. I'll ask Mr. Reed to reply. I would tell it's not to ask Mr. Black. My Lord, if I could just deal with a couple of very minor points first. If you turn to my skeleton at paragraph 5.4. Page 11. Uh, an attempt was, a, a pot shot was taken at my drafting because I referred to Article 60. Uh, Malone and Friends entirely right. It's not Article 60, it's now Article 71A. So you may want to correct in manuscript, um, but in my, so that doesn't undermine the integrity uh, of the submission. It's a small error which I seek to correct. Um, in terms of the difference between a DIFC licensed establishment and a DIFC establishment. The reality is that the uh, licensing authorization registration regime, the only one of which we're aware in the DIFC as a financial center, is the DFSA, uh, uh, the financial uh, licensing authorization and registration regimes. Now, why 
the question may be validly asked, did they not, did the draftsman not refer it to specific paragraphs or specific articles of the regulatory law or of the market's law? <coughs> um, well, the answer to that, in my submission, is relatively simple. If you're setting out the jurisdiction of the DRC court in the JL, uh, an important statute which is intended to last, you would be very slow to link your definitions to precise provisions within DIFC statutes because you would be endlessly uh, amending them as the relevant underlying legislative, DIFC legislation has changed. So it's entirely understandable that the draftsman of the JL would have used broad concepts such as authorised, registered and licensed by reference, broadly speaking, to the uh, regulatory and statutory regime dealing with um, financial uh, licensing, registration and authorisation. Uh, in common parlance, if one speaks, if one talks with a, a DIC lawyer, licensed DIC establishment is understood as meaning licensed, registered, or authorised by the DFSA. A DIFC establishment is generally understood to be a DIFC company, a company incorporated under DIFC law. Now, obviously, it, insofar as a, a DIFC establishment is authorised or is licensed or is registered. It, it may also be a DIFC, sorry, a licensed DIFC establishment. And indeed, within the definition of DIFC establishment, it says including licensed DIFC establishments. It's important for our purpose to remember that the, the, the findings of the judge, uh, and one looks at paragraph 38 of his judgment, were that this was a, that uh, FAB was a DIFC licensed establishment, licensed DIFC establishment. So he was looking, and the court is considering that definition. Uh, and as I've, as I've sought to explain, um, if one looks at the uh, DIFC establishment definition, one also has this concept of being established uh, under, sorry, in accordance with DIFC law. And we say that is essentially a company that's incorporated under DIFC law or a DIFC company. Uh, clearly, there was an intention that insofar as there is ever a system of licensing or authorization or registration of entities within the DFC, under DFC law in the future that may, for example, extend to restaurants. I don't understand if it does, but if it did, if you had licensed restaurants in the DFC, that system of licensing, even if you weren't a DFC company, would subject you to DFC uh, core party jurisdiction. Um, but uh, as we understand it, there is no other system uh, of registration, uh, licensing, or, or um, authorization outside the financial context as, as yet. And even the example which Milani Friends sought I law firms are registered and, and when, when one looks at the registration of DNFBPs, that's ancillary service providers, under Article 70A of the statute, that is in fact within the regulatory, the regulatory law. Um, so at the moment any authorization, registration or licensing is under the regulatory law or the markets law. Um, Sorry, the markets law dealing, I should say, with, with recognition, which is not uh, in any of those categories. Um, I just want to revisit quickly the distinction between UAE and non-UAE entities and why we say the judge is narrowing his judgment simply doesn't work. Of course it's the true, it's true that if, a, you, if an Abu Dhabi bank uh, trades on NASDAQ for clients, uh, it is entitled to do so on the basis of solicitation and advice. Uh, similarly, if Goldman Sachs does it for a New York client, it cannot solicit the, the trade and it cannot offer advice. It has to do it on an execution only basis. It is subject to the restriction in 2.5.1G. But to the extent that a uh, Mashrek or a bank in Abu Dhabi uh, is trading on NASDAQ and is therefore carrying on a financial service in the UAE, so is Goldman Sachs albeit subject to a condition that restricts it from advising or soliciting that trade. And that's why we say that the uh, attempt by the judge to limit the scope of his jurisdiction, this is, oh, this is only really dealing with UAE and, and Abu Dhabi banks, just doesn't work. And that's why uh, we put before the court evidence of the concern in FAB and of the uh, expectation that that concern is felt more broadly than just FAB and the General Counsel, Mr. Basbus, of, of FAB. Um, it's important to bear in mind that the, the suggestion that the appeal is absurd and the no prospect totally unsustainable 
one has to look at the judgment of uh, Justice Richmond Field, Justice uh, Richard Field. He it was given uh, very briefly uh, in three pages on the basis of merely written submissions. Uh, he declined to make a disclosure order, which in my experience is an extraordinary situation where a, a court is freezing injunction, freezing uh, assets, whether on a proprietary basis or, or not. He was clearly very aware of the implications in the wider UAE and Abu Dhabi in particular of this court ordering banks in Abu Dhabi to disclose private and confidential information. There was a continuing suggestion that somehow FAB was, was here with a strategy and was seeking to mislead, seeking to get out from under the jurisdiction. FAB is here for one reason, which is that it holds uh, assets which are disputed. It is, there's an allegation which is found to be arguable in this court that they have in effect been stolen. But FAB that has no interest in this case. FAB uh, seeks to act consistently with uh, its own regulation, consistently with the legal uh, apparatus and environment within Abu Dhabi and the UAE. It's subject to very stringent requirements in respect of confidentiality and very stringent requirements in respect of its compliance with the mandate of its customers. Those are fundamental to uh, wider UAE banking law. It, it's not trying to cover up fraud. It's not trying to uh, got some part of some conspiracy to uh, prevent this court from having information or to avoid disclosure. It is simply trying to act in accordance with the obligations that it is under as a matter of UAE law. And in my submission, Mr Justice Field was very aware of that. That's why he made a no disclosure order. He gave, uh, extraordinarily, he gave permission to appeal against his own judgment. He did it on two grounds. Firstly, that it had a real prospect of success. And secondly, because he recognised that it had important implications. Now, of course, it's technically right, Mr. Black, to say, um, well, insofar as we construe, the court construes a, a, a statute, that isn't expanding, that's just recognising an existing jurisdiction. But the reality is that construction of a jurisdictional provision can have the effect of expanding jurisdiction insofar as that jurisdiction is perceived within a jurisdiction or within a market. And it's precisely for that reason that he gave permission to appeal on the basis of some other compelling reason because he recognised the important implications insofar as his judgment would be seen as expanding and extending the jurisdiction of the DIFC court. I, I do just want to... Uh, the, the suggestion was made that um, I misrepresented what the judge said uh, in terms of what he was doing as a matter of construction. I do just want to take you briefly to paragraph 33 of the judgment to emphasise two words. And so paragraph 33, page 11, internal pagination. And the second, starting at the second sentence. However, no expert evidence is proposed to be called on the meaning of the original text. And without such evidence, I conclude it will be impossible for the court to decide what means to be given to the Arabic word that has been translated as authorised. I shall therefore, and it's the word therefore I underline, I shall therefore not attempt to decide which of the rival meanings of the Arabic in question is the correct meaning, but shall instead adopt the approach prescribed in Karafi of not allowing a literalist construction. So it's by reason of his inability to enter the linguistic debate, and I should say that inability arises precisely because Larmag didn't really put before the court any evidence of. So that was a choice of Larmag in seeking to assert jurisdiction that they would not put any evidence before the court as to language. And it's because of the inability of the judge to enter that debate, because of the decision taken by Larmag not to adduce evidence as to language. I shall therefore not attempt to decide which of the rival meanings in question is the correct one, but shall instead adopt the approach in Karafi of not allowing a literacy approach. So because I can't enter that, I have to enter that debate. I have to follow. I have to use a literalist construction of the, uh, of the English... Uh, not, sorry, allowing the literacy. I have to take the broad construction of the English, English word at the expense of losing sight of legislative purpose. So, it's, so it's both, I have to take the, the broad meaning and I have to uh, engage with the legislative purpose. Clearly he attempted to engage with the legislative purpose, but he simply identified the legislative purpose as being his construction of the relevant provision. 
and, and, and what is urged on the court now is it should do the same in pursuing an autonomous, a free style, a free jazz, if you like, approach to the construction of authorization. Uh, and that we say is wrong. That's it, Mr. Mr. Reed. That's it, Mr. Reed. Great. It is, my lord. Uh, uh, it's two thirty London time. That's your five thirty Dubai. Uh, we'll take a short break, and we'll come back. Uh, I've not had my lunch yet, so give me <laughs> half an hour or forty minutes uh, to to come back. We'll take a half an hour, 40 minutes break. Let, uh, let me discuss with the judges also. Okay? Adjourn for 30 minutes. Yes, the judges, we are in. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I would like first to express our gratitude to both councils for their submissions which are so ably put before us. And uh, we also take into consideration that this is an urgent matter, that we have to make a decision quickly. Uh, the, the, I think the, the injunction is extended to, when was that? When, when is it uh, extended to eight weeks? from the date of the judgment. So when's that? It's the 8th of 4th, 4th of October, something else? 13th of November or October? October. Yeah, October. So uh, we have carefully considered the submissions by both parties, particularly those by the appellants. And we conclude that the Donald judge of first instance did not err in his conclusion and rightly concluded as he did that this court has the jurisdiction to hear the claims. We therefore dismiss the appeal with cost. Cost, unless agreed, will be determined by the registrar. So do I have to make any order that uh, you fix a date before the, 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 what do you call, the judge of first instance? Do I need to make that order, or is it just a matter of course? I think, uh, Chief Justice, no need to... Uh, uh, no need to make an order. order. Yes. Okay. So, uh, so, with that, thank you very much to parties. All the best to everybody. Thank From you very cold, much, wet, uh, London. Okay. Thank you. Uh, may, may, I, may I just, uh, yeah. there are some submissions on costs. Um, this appeal, even if it was unsuccessful, raised uh, significant issues of public importance, which is why exceptionally in giving commission, it was found that uh, there was some other compelling reason. Uh, clearly, it, it has explained by the judge in giving commission, it has significant implications. Uh, I, I forgot the... to mention to you that uh, the grounds, uh, the reasons will come out later. We'll provide the reasons later. We'll be coming uh, out with reasons later. No, I appreciate that, but the, the order, as I understand it, has been intimated. is an order that the cost of the appeal should be ordered to be paid by the appellant. And we say in circumstances where there were significant public importance, we would ask that the court make no order as to cost, because we, we are a Abu Dhabi bank that has sought to vindicate its position, sought to explain the position of uh, UAE-regulated banks uh, in terms of the jurisdiction of this court. And given the issue of public importance, which we've raised not only on our own behalf, but no doubt on behalf of many other uh, recognised uh, bodies, that there should be uh, no order as to cost, or should be some significant discount as to the costs that should be borne by the appellant. Uh, Omar and Ali, can you, uh, uh, what, what do you yeah, think uh, of? Uh, Chief Justice, we can uh, ask the party uh, uh, to file a further submission regarding the cost, and uh, during the preparation of the judgment, we can uh, reply on the uh, cost point. Okay, so we'll, make, we'll not make the order for cost yet. We will hear your submission on cost, written submission on cost. 
So, and the, the deadline for exchanging uh, submission, Mr. Black? Yeah. I'm so sorry. Yeah, you are busy that way. Really. No, 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 I was my... <laughs> well, I, no, no. The, the panel uh, the, uh, issued an oral judgment regarding the appeal. We dismissed yes. the appeal at the beginning with the cost. Then, um, Mr. Uh, Red said that uh, we need to uh, see the, the cost is supposed to not on the uh, on the appellant side. It's supposed withdrawn, right? Yes, no orders, no orders to cost on the yeah. appeal. So, so well, our suggestion, final submission regarding the cost, and we did it. On, uh, on our judgment. Yes, the, the, what I think, I think we were confused about was whether the submission was about the quantum of the cost or whether there should be costs. Yeah, should be the cost, not the, the quantum of the cost. Whether the cost should fall on the appellant, and, and if so, whether all of the costs should fall on the appellant in, in, in view of the public importance of the point raised by the appeal. Yes. We're, we're not getting into issues of quantum. Or, no, or nothing quantum. Is that all right with you? Thank you. Is that all right? So, uh, the, the, the deadline for the uh, submission? Seven days. A short submission. One week? One week. One week. Seven days. Yeah. Seven days. So then we expect to get uh, next week, next uh, Wednesday? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank okay, CJ. What? We are done. All right. Court is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.